I should have done that first. We'll see what happens.
And so she did a next thing I know, she found seven hours. I said, I could so kiss man. you right now. <laughs> man. <laughs> I want you to sign mine. <laughs> I kept my copy. How you doing? I left my dad everything on the kitchen table. <laughs> He's really good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I read, I read more of it than I normally do. <laughs> That's what I did. I, that's how I got out of it. I have never been happier about something in my entire life. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I mean, I got out of my comfort zone. Y
to try to address some of the challenges that we face in the prior fiscal year. This table here summarizes <coughs> the information that is in Exhibit A of the report that we provided to you prior to this meeting and included the committee the whole agenda. And what we're here to say is that we do have some areas of challenge with respect to uh, serving of our funds, the most notable being in the general fund in terms of end of year revenues for fiscal year 24. As of uh, when we did this report, we were just under $88.2 million and our end of year expenditures were approximately $94.6 million. Now, this is still below our total uh, appropriated annual budget for fiscal year 2024. So we are not over budget in terms of expenditures. And I want to make that clear. We have not exceeded our appropriation authority for the general fund. However, because of this variance between revenues and expenditures, we are looking at about a $6.4 million deficit as of the end of fiscal year 2024 for that particular fiscal year. And in total, our expenditures increased by almost 6% in fiscal year 2024 compared to where they had been in fiscal year 2023. We did have a $1.7 million deficit in the Powell Bill Fund, but we expected that due to the fact that we had a significant resurfacing program that you approved uh, and that was appropriated for fiscal year 2024. So as you can see, we spent a lot more money, 326% more in 24 than we spent in 23. And that was using savings that had been accumulated in the Powell Bill Fund for that purpose. With respect to the electric fund, we had about a $4.7 million deficit. Expenditures only went up about 4%. And again, that reflects a combination of capital outlay that had uh, been funded or been financed in prior years and some other projects that we need to take on, as well as the impact of, to a smaller, lesser degree, the impact of the true up that was that we had to start paying to Duke Energy towards the final quarter of last fiscal year. All of our other utility funds, gas, water, sewer, and stormwater, finished the year, or we, from a preliminary perspective, have finished the year with positive balances, with revenues uh, exceeding expenditures, which is what we wanted to see because we had had some challenges with those funds in prior years. So that is kind of a summary of where we are preliminarily speaking with respect to all of our funds for fiscal year 2024. Going back, Mr. Mr. Hunt, yes, Mayor has a question. Just one question, and, and you're okay, maybe you're going to go over it. But you said uh, on the general fund, the authority, we're not above the authority that we issued for expenditures for fiscal year 2024. What was that authority number? It's a little over $100 million. $100 million. Yeah, it was 94, and I think we we are about $8 million over. We're about eight, we have about an 8% variance. That negative 8% shows that we're 8% below budget below the budget authority and that's the case in all of these so it was a little over 100 i think we're around 101 million if i remember correctly i could be wrong so we approved a budget a little over 100 million dollars with anticipated revenues of less than 90 million that was that was that was the aspect of the fund balance appropriations you appropriate during the course of the year okay. yes. well, i want to dig on that a little bit later but anyway, yes, sir. Just... So, so mr hunter you mentioned about the electric but also the general fund does it the um, projects previously approved, but they had carryover funds. So that also uh, impacted the general fund as well? It, fun, it impacted a little bit, yes. Define a little bit. I would say that we did, while we did make some, project, some progress with some of those projects, including the resurfacing project, the, the part that is funded out of the general fund from vehicle permit fees, and there was some equipment uh, funds, and there was also at least one construction project that I know of that was, that was, that was completed. Um, as I was going to show in the next slide, a significant portion of this was due to current ex current expenditures, primarily compensation. But but for for the projects, was that one million, two million, three million, or I would say it's probably around three million. Okay, so well, that's six point five half of, about half of that is for expected projects. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. I have a question. Yes, sir. Those ones that you labor underforming, like license permits. Uh, miscellaneous, those uh, uh, have always been low rated revenues, correct? They have been more, they've been more volatile, so this, so we obviously make an effort with the budget, and so I would say, to your point, and it explains in this slide, those particular ones, licenses and permits, miscellaneous, those two are, are a little more susceptible to not meeting target from year to year. We try to do our best to be conservative on those, and we just didn't hit it. They're also a smaller share of the overall budget compared to other sources. So there's not a huge contribution to the revenue. That's correct. Right. 
but we do want to point out that they were, we want to be fully transparent in that regard. And that was not called the, the deficit of 6.4, was it? No, sir. Thank you. Just want to make sure that this clear to the public of the deficit not coming from those. If they, if they had hit target, we would still be in noticeable yes. deficit. Yes, sir. With respect to the deficit projection, as I mentioned before, it's under 6.41 million. There is reserves and fund balance, and of course, the program, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I, I just kind of wanted to uh, admit, it's cool. I can write it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't want to break in front of it, but um, I just wanted to make sure, and thank you, Gibb, but trying to just keep from having so much uh, discussion to cut you off. Being that there are so many people in the room from the public, it might help. I mean, we understand, but to just kind of break it down more layman terms, I think that might help from the constant repeat and a lot of the questions, just just for the context of the room. Yes, sir. Understood. So, and I apologize. I was just trying to keep summarized because we got a significant agenda here. Oh, right, it's fine. I'm, I'm, it. I'm just trying to keep you from getting stopped so much. Understood. Um, the projection again on the deficit for the general fund based on actual revenues and actual expenditures in fiscal year 2024 was just under 6.41 million. We do have reserves available. You've already appropriated those expenditures for fiscal year 24 to absorb that loss. So those have already been appropriated. Um, the biggest challenge that we saw with respect to expenditures was that personnel compensation calls were higher than expected. Um, and I, it was about a situation where overall our compensation costs were over 14 percent more than what they were in fiscal year 2023. And if you looked at it with respect to our final revised to our revised budget as of June 30th, you would see that it was about 9.9 million, 9.5 million dollars over budget. That is um, a noticeable increase and a noticeable imbalance. We will be able to address it uh, as part of the audit and final and close out of the fiscal year process. But it is something that uh, was not necessarily expected. We were hoping that we could bring it in within a more manageable level, but that was not the case for fiscal year 2024. Um, the good news is that for most of our revenues, and especially for property tax, which is the largest source of revenue we have in the general fund, almost all of our current revenues met or exceeded projections. So we did finish out the year overall with respect to current revenues in a good position. We've already mentioned licenses and permits and miscellaneous. The one that I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about is sales tax because our sales tax projections were about a little over more than $700,000. Our actual sales tax, I should say, my apologies. Our actual sales tax was about seven, was more than, was more than $700,000 below our budgeted projection. And this is due to some significant swings in activity, particularly I was, when I was looking at it, particularly in the third quarter of the fiscal year. We noticed a 25% increase in refunds that affected sales tax in both Nash and Edcombe County. Yes, sir. I want to go back to the 9.95 million more than budget, um, because during the budget process, um, several council members had asked about the budgetary impact for unauthorized positions and uh, additional increases that was not uh, due to policy and the 36% increase, how it was going to be sustainable. Uh, but we never really got a true answer in how we were going to sustain it. So as a result, this is why the 9.95 million it certainly contributed to it. There were, there were several contributing factors to it. And I would say that um, the information that was provided to you back last spring, uh, back in May of 2023, was primarily looking at the impact of those increases to the budget for fiscal year 2023. And it was uncertain to a certain extent uncertain to an extent how much those increases were going to affect our budget in fiscal year 2024 based on when hirings occurred and other factors. And this, in some cases, was the most significant scenario that could occur with respect to those to the implementation of those increases. And one last thing, if we would have gotten the full uh, uh, compensation and pay plan, uh, most of this could have been avoided. You would certainly. Some you would have certainly, we would have certainly been in a position to provide more detailed information about the financial impacts for a full year as well as in future years. So, we 
information was being withheld, then you staff could really forecast this we were, coming. It was a limited process. We were limited in our process to be able to conduct the analysis because our availability of the information in the budget office was more limited than it had been in the prior process. So was that done deliberately or was it done? I cannot speak to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to end in, end in you. Yes, sir. Uh, several questions. You mentioned Exhibit A and capital outlay for the year was $9 million below what we had uh, budgeted for fiscal year. Would you uh, go into some detail about what that $9 million reduction in capital outlay had as a result on our overall performance this year in terms of deficit? Yes, sir. Most of that was tied to uh, equipment purchases that were financed, heavy, heavy equipment that we use for operation throughout the city, primarily in public works. Uh, those vehicles, those, those pieces of equipment were ordered, but they were not delivered. So they're not expensed. For, for government budgeted purposes, they're not expensed. In fiscal 24, they're not expensed until they're delivered. And so I would say that was approximately about $5 million of that difference. Um, the other was tied to some other construction projects. I would have to go back and look specifically at those and give you a list of those specific projects that were either not completed or not started in, in the fiscal year. For those projects not delivered or started, are we going are they subject for work in the current 25? I know at least budget. At least one of them is one that was not completed had to do with City Hall, the work that's being done on the on the ground floor of City Hall, and that's about a million dollar project. The other projects I will have to have to evaluate and take a look at. Obviously, the the significant over budget and comp and personnel costs. You know, all during the year, I kept asking for timely financial review. We really never had that process. Yes, sir. And I sure hope starting this year with the document we put in place about month in financial results by the 15th of the following month, we should have being informed a lot sooner about this huge salary and wage over budget. I can certainly understand that and the report that is being prepared for August, for the end of August. I actually started work on that yesterday and today. Yeah, we should have by the end of this week. That's fine. But getting back to the comp plan, when is the council going to be presented with a copy of the comp plan that was, it was implemented last year, correct? Yes, sir. When are we going to have a full copy of that for our study and review? I don't have a, I don't have a date for that, but we're working on it. I'll pull all of that stuff together as to where we started and what happened and all of that. So we'll be coming to you with that, but I don't have a date. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because I kept asking for it all last year and we never got an answer. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Fortune. Thanks again, Ken. Uh, in a situation like we have here in Rocky Mountain, where we had a lot of vacancies uh, in staff and uh, in a position where the city is trying to grow and a lot of redevelopment, um, how common is it to see uh, over budgeting, uh, and as you stated earlier, still being uh, below what has been uh, allocated or appropriated uh, upon authority in the budget. But how common is that to see that in a city such as ours in a local municipality, just in your experience? So I've been doing the budget here for 18 years, and what I will say is that we've never had a situation like this occur. Uh, we have certainly had circumstances in the past where we have had noticeable vacancies in various departments. I think you're spe speaking more specifically about police, but we also had some other departments with vacancies at that time. We've had that issue with police in the past. We've had that issue with fire in the past. We've had that issue even in the utilities in the past. And in those circumstances, we were typically able to work it where there might have been a slight overage, I mean, a slight uh, deficit with respect to those particular accounts that we could adjust for. We understand that. This was a more, this was more significant than what I've seen. And so far, because other cities are in I would say this, I've not seen this from other cities in the past. I don't know what's happened this year, 
Uh, I do know that this is a matter that uh, everybody is trying to be very careful of, and it's part of the reason why, as they're evaluating compensation, they're trying to do their best to make sure that, obviously, we, we are competing in a market for talent. All of us are. And at the same time, we're also trying to have something that is sustainable long term, not just in the year of implementation, but from year and year after that. So, so in, in your experience, in your, in your 18 years here, it's fair to say that local municipalities in our area haven't been able to experience this. This is a new phenom. I would say that it is a new phenom, but I would also say it is something that we should have planned for more effectively. This is the type of thing we do our best to try to avoid in terms of respecting the taxpayers. And, but you've yet to see areas around us in our neighbor areas, what they've done and across the state. And so yet now. Okay. Council Mark, uh, I said a disaster. And in my 21 years, uh, we have never, ever experienced anything as such as this. Uh, when council adopt policies, procedures, then that's what we should abide by. Also, I do recall um, Council Member Harris uh, on numerous occasions had asked um, previous administration about uh, how much overage it would have been. And I think one time it was quoted a million, and it went from a million to three. Now that has grown and grown and grown. Uh, even during the time of retreat time, that the council tried to have one of the subject areas, the budget, but could not get it on the agenda. All of this could have been forecast and prevented. Now, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but every time I came to this council, I would continually sound the alarm. And Number one, I'm disappointed and embarrassed um, to be in a state like this. But hopefully, um, I know we will get through it. But when information is being withheld and it's in the minutes, I went back and pulled the minutes uh, before we adopt the budget. I said, how can we adopt the budget when the council have not been provided full information to be able to evaluate the budget. But I'm going to vote for it because there's so many organizations and citizens that depend upon some of the programs that we were offering. And the last thing for the comp and pay plan study, you know, it was a how could we adopt a compensation and pay plan without having a full document before us to review? Uh, even with the position, you know, how can we adopt something that we've never seen or had privy to uh, the information to be able to properly evaluate where we are going? And so um, I hope that this would be uh, a turning point for us today. Okay, look, we'll have these two right now, but I'm going to request that maybe we'll wait to the presentation of each one before we ask questions. I thought some of the questions earlier were going to be brief, but we've got a full agenda tonight. So, Councilman Harris? Yes, and obviously, Mayor Pro Tim, finances is the most important thing that we as a council need. To I, I'm not denying that, on. Councilman Harris, but out of, out of respect to everybody here, what I'm asking is that we listen to the presentation and then have our questions towards the end. That's what I'm asking. I understand, but this is important. We have about 120 vacancies as of July 1. Is that about correct? That is correct. And the, and the report you get in August will have that updated at the end of August. If, if 50 of those vacancies during this past budget year had been filled, what kind of substantial financial impact would that have had on our on average, you're looking at about 2.5 to 3 million dollars. In addition to the negative 6.4. Yes, sir. That's all on the general fund. Yes. That's 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 my question. I'll hold my comments until the end. Thank you. 
I want to quickly go through this uh, with respect to sales tax. Um, again, rest, refunds increased 25% as experienced by the county. As a result, we actually saw, compared to fiscal year 23, a decline in gross collections assigned to Nash County for fiscal 24. We did see a strong increase in gross collections for Edgecombe County, but our sales tax is about 75% tied to Nash County and 25% tied to Edgecombe. Overall, total local net collections declined 1% from where they were for fiscal 23. And again, because of the lag that there is in the reporting and, and, the, and notification with respect to sales tax, that was not something that we were able to easily determine prior to budget. The good news was overall, and this is in part because of the additional revenues that we received from through the state's redistrib redistribution of sales tax revenues, our revenues actually increased 10.6% compared to fiscal year 23. However, for, as when we prepared the budget for fiscal year 2024, it was, project, it was prepared with a projected 15% increase. So the 10.6% came close to our average that we've seen since fiscal year 2019, but did not reach the 15% number. And so we were about $730,000 below budget. Right now, if we look at the actual for 24 and where we have the budget projected, we're looking at about a 6.4% about a 6 increase. We should come close to hitting that target. We are going to be monitoring it on a monthly basis to see where we are. We, we will be reporting that when we present quarterly reports to council at the end of each quarter. I spoke about the Powell bill. We actually received $122,000 more last year than we had projected, and that was due to an increase in, in, in allocations that was approved by the General Assembly last year. Um, we did make progress with our resurfacing and dirt street projects. It resulted in an end-of-year fund balance for the Powell Bill Fund of about $1.2 million. That had been drawn down significantly due to the resurfacing work in 23. That was actually more 22 and 23. And also, again, when we do resurfacing, it's a combination of Powell Bill as well as the monies that we receive from 20 of the $25 that is paid by our residents for their vehicle permit. But that's about $825,000. So that's the money that we have available for surface work, for sidewalks, and for some other eligible projects that are done on an annual basis. With respect to our utilities, um, our electric fund actually did come, come in line with our margin meeting budget projections. So it was not a revenue issue with respect to our calls for utility services. We anticipated, uh, we did anticipate some of a deficit. And again, that's reflecting capital projects and some other items like the, uh, like the short-term impact of the true up that we're paying to, to, to do. On the gas fund side and on the other utilities, you will see that our mar on the gas fund side, our margin exceeded projections, and that was enabling us to not that one that 1.1 million that you see. There's already a million that's been taken out of it that is going into revenue state into rate stabilization. So it was actually a two million dollar a two million dollar surplus. One million of that goes to rate stabilization. On the water fund side. Sales came close to projections, and the water and our water resources department did a very good job of restraining their expenditures. On the sewer fund side, we did see sales aided by rate increases. We were able to make some improvement in some capital areas. Uh, as we are working through a capital update that we hope to provide you in October, uh, we'll be talking about significant pro some significant projects we have coming coming along. And again, it may need to require us to consider sometime next year of uh, issuing a revenue bond specifically for sewer improvements due to the nature of these projects and the way that they have to be financed. And then on the stormwater side, um, we're still waiting uh, final approval of federal funding for our biggest project, which is the downtown drainage improvements. Uh, that's to primarily fund that. And we have not changed stormwater rates uh, in six or seven years. We have not made any adjustments to our stormwater rate. That was part of the cost of service study that we also did for water and sewer about two years ago. As we're preparing, as we're reviewing what we're doing this year and looking forward to 26 and beyond, we may need to be looking at a rate adjustment in the stormwater area. And, and that is something that we will continue to evaluate. With respect to what we are doing right now to try to address what happened last fiscal year, we, the manager and staff are carefully evaluating any additional hiring to the first half of this current fiscal year. Uh, to make sure that we are only necessarily hiring who we need to hire to address certain 
certain needs within the city. We are, a, I know the manager's plan to present you a copy of the full study with respect to classification and compensation. We are making sure that future HR actions are in proper compliance as well as not only with classification compensation plan, but also with city policies. And then there is, of course, the monitoring of our current revenues to make sure that if there are any variances or unexpected trends that we start, unexpected activity that we start to see, that we are able to identify it and address it appropriately with respect to expenditures. And one of those is with respect to property tax, and that is what I wanted to cover next. I realize it's item two on the agenda. So, um, so, so let's go to some questions. I know Captain yes, sir. Blackwell had some had questions. For sure, I have. Uh, thank you. I have two questions in particular. Um, before budget adoption, but during budget discussion, um, we were told that only two new positions were going to be created um, by uh, with the adoption of the budget. But afterwards, we learned that there were several new positions. Uh, that were uh, included in the budget. How many positions were they, and do you have do you I would, have? I would, a, I would honestly have to go back to my notes. I realize that the number that the number that is where we are now is not necessarily consistent with where we should be. That there's more positions than there necessarily should be. Um, what I will say is, as far as I know, it was only two for fiscal year 25, but it does look like there may have been some activity in 24 that was not properly accounted. And so, do we know which departments those positions were allocated in, and do we have a total amount of overage? What I would what I would say is that the one department there there are a couple. The one department that I know that we that we still need to go back and look at is the Department of Technology Services. There might be one or two positions there. Um, I think there might be an overhire in one other department. I'm, I have to go back and take a look at the information. So when you state ensure proper compliance with classification and compensation plan, how will that review be conducted and how will we be updated? I'm not, I cannot speak, I cannot speak entirely for that because that is a personnel matter. I would say that our goal right now with respect to any positions that are presented to be refilled once a position becomes open is to do our best to make sure that it is in line with where we believe we're supposed to be and then there's subsequent work that would be done to ensure that we are where we're supposed to be with respect to our position control. And we are acknowledging that there were positions that were created not adhering to city adopted code and policy. I would say yes. Okay, thank you. And then the second issue I have relates to um, drainage yes. and your, uh, your budget related to stormwater. I know I continue to perceive, and I think Mr. Interim, uh, that we've already discussed it, but. Um, Battleboro drainage issues that have gone unanswered for a number of years and uh, community members there are wondering, and I am too, you know, do we know exactly what need, what improvements are needed in Battleboro and uh, have those improvements hit the capital improvement plan? Do we have an amount and do we have a year where that's anticipated to be addressed? I cannot speak specifically with respect to Battleboro. So I'm assuming, though, that we'll take care of that when we're looking at possibility of a revenue bond to cover those types of, was that sewer or stormwater? The, the main thing would be sewer, but certainly, and I'm not, I don't want to get ahead of our skis on it, but obviously at the same time, we could, I mean, you would probably want to look at water, sewer, and stormwater at the same time and structure that accordingly based on the rate schedule and the projects themselves. Those are the hardest projects to obtain financing outside of a bond for a larger scale. So those those three areas would probably be something we would look at. I can't speak to the numbers on them, but, but they all impact each other. Correct. Yes, Councilor Knight. Yes, for some of us uh, who may not uh, be aware or know, and including our citizens, uh, for new position, uh, what is the city policy? I know we have one. I think I brought that uh, policy to. Council that those new positions must be ratified and approved by the council. Again, you or Mr. Barney say that. Yes, yes, sir. Well, you don't have to be verbatim. But. Well, in the past, what we would do, what, what we have done with the city council is when we come with a budget, we always uh, 
have the um, number of positions by department and by division listed. So in sanitation, for example, we have uh, sanitation equipment operator one, have the pay grade, and then how many of those we have, six of those or 10 of them, whatever it is, sanitation equipment operator two, pay grade, and four of those. And, and when you adopt the budget, what you're approving is, is, is that, that pay, that uh, job title, that classification is what I'm trying to say, and the pay range and the number of positions. And so that's, and so we, and, and, and so our, we use that as the way to control really how many people, how many positions we fill. We don't, we don't want to overfill you know, what, what you have approved in your budget. That's how we control that. Evidently that wasn't, I didn't see it this year, but evidently that didn't happen this time. Is that right? So, so moving moving forward, but I think a previous question: Could we, it's in the near future, receive a report showing what was um, the, approved in the budget, and what positions we have now, um, and and then that way would answer all these questions that we're having right here. And, um, and what, I'm, what I'm planning to work on is is to recreate all of that, going back to where we were at one time in 2023. I think is where we. Had it, had it all, and then what the pay and classification plan was recommending, and then what we have here in 2024 is what I want to try to recreate. What I wanted you to say, uh, uh, not putting words in your mouth, but we do have a policy. If a city manager or whoever come up with a new position that is not in the pay plan or compensation plan study, that they uh, bring the position to the council to be approved, you just can't add position and start paying people. We if it's not in right. the past uh, filled position, created positions that were not authorized by this city council, past city councils in the budget. <clears throat> Thank you. Council Walker. Yeah, I'll be very brief, Ken. Ken, what is your current position? Our current position is assistant to the city manager for budget evaluation. And when was that created? Okay, and what was, was I was promoted from my prior position, and the position was reclassified by council. And what was your prior position? Budget evaluation manager. Okay, and that was done when? That was the position I inherited when I started here in 2006. So you said 2020 was the new position? It's when I, my position was reclassified. Okay, and that was done by council? Council approved that. Okay. Councilman Harris? Yeah, thank you. Um, Councilman Blackwell? You've asked a, a question that I would like for the public to have a little bit more information. When we were presented with last year's budget in our workshop in Durham, and also with various meetings we had in this council, the city manager's office budget had 18 people. But the revised budget that was posted on the city's website and this was a surprise to me, but I guess if you hunt long enough, you can find information. The revised budget had 20 approved. So that's two. HR, and we were aware of those two, but it went 17, so that's plus one. Department of Business and Collection Services we approved 62, the revised budget, 63, so plus one. The police department, 228, the revised budget posted online, 231. Department of Development Services, 32, the revised budget, 33. And I want the council now. I asked the city manager, could he explain the difference? And his comment was, there's a typo. There's a word up there, um, Ken, that kind of disturbs me a little bit. And if somebody could elaborate a little bit, but the word restore. Restore compliance with city policies. 
is more than if there being more than one particular policy, maybe not adhere to. Can you elaborate on that? Because to me, restore means you have complete loss of confidence and you got to build it back up. Yes, sir. So I would say, obviously, as we said, already talked about, there are some concerns with respect to personnel policies and our compliance with those as a city from a managerial perspective. Mm -hmm. The other item that we know of that uh, we are working on is with respect to procurement, with respect to contracts. Um, and that is something that I know that we have been um, working through to determine uh, because our policies with respect to procurement are more rigorous than state statute. Right. And it is obvious in the evaluations that we've made that there have been instances where contracts were approved in a manner that was consistent with state statute but was not consistent with city policies with respect to procurement. So those right now, based on our based on our evaluation, are the two areas of policy that we need to address. So I did put that there. Those are the two areas. I would say, so far as I know, that our staff, outside of managerial operations, are doing an excellent job of following the policies that they're supposed to follow. Good. But there are some higher level issues that we need to address and that is what we are working on. And we are certainly, while we are looking at what we've done and trying to correct that, there is also making sure that as we go forward that no new actions are in violation of any city policies. Well, that's good to hear, but isn't it a policy statewide that uh, the city manager or county manager or any municipality must or should know the policies of the local authority, not just state, but really that local policy kind of I don't I don't want to quote our ordinances specifically but I will say it is certainly a best practice okay Mr. Ryan, let's, let's go on to the next please all right so another item that we wanted to update you with is respect to property taxes uh, that are, of course are paid by all of our residents and business owners who own property here inside the city for fiscal year 2025 um, naturally, this is in part due to the fact that as we were preparing, preparing the budget for fiscal year 2025, we were dealing with a revaluation for both Nash and Edgecombe counties that uh, was completed earlier this year. And both counties uh, in March and uh, April of this year, pro excuse me, provided us with preliminary information with respect to the valuations for taxable property inside the city limits. We had received information from both the tax offices in Nash and Edgecombe County. Based on that information that we received, which primarily deals with real property, land, and improvements, we had calculated an increase in taxable values of 25.7%. So based on the revenue neutral calculation as stipulated by state statute, we calculated a revenue neutral rate of 56 cents. The rate before was 68 and a half cents. We calculated a revenue neutral rate of 56 cents. Council then, during budget deliberations, decided to adopt a, a, a tax rate of 58 cents, which increased revenues by $1.1 million, which is currently held in reserve by council uh, in, a, in an account that is for council's, just for council's decision on how to use. So about two weeks ago, our finance department had received the actual valuation levy information for the purposes of issuing tax bills and knowing what our levy is for the 2024 tax year, also known as fiscal year 2025. And the key thing I want to point here is this was the actual for 24, which is what we used to base for the sake of calculation. We had budgeted, and the key thing I want to point into here is with real property, land and improvements. In 2024, both counties combined city limits, it was just, over, just under 3.1 million. We had, sorry, correct, 3.1 billion. And then we, based on the information the county provided us, estimated $4.2 billion. When we got the actual information, it was over $4.4 billion. Now, I will say that has never happened before. Normally, when you have the final numbers, it's actually a little less than what the projection is because you're going through an appeals process. You know that there's going to be some reduction, and we talked about that during the budget process. So as a result... 
total valuation we thought in 25, and we set the budget and the tax rate based on this was the revenue neutral rate based on this was 5.6 billion, and it actually ended up being close to 5.9 billion. So our valuation increase was actually what we thought was 25.7, actually ended up being 31.8 percent which if we had known at the time, the revenue neutral rate would have been 53 cents as opposed to what we presented to you at 56 cents. As a result, we are currently estimating, and it's at the collection, at the same collection rate we use for budget purposes, that the property tax account will generate approximately $1.6 million in additional revenue over budget for this current fiscal year. And that is without updates to vehicles or public service property because those are provided by the state and they have not provided those as of this point. So to recap, the valuations that the counties provided us in final were greater than what they provided us in the original estimates that they provided in the spring. And as a result, we saw that real property values increased for our residents by 46.2% on average. If you looked at Nash County, 43.5% in Edgecombe. And that our revenue neutral rate do, should have been, if we had known the information, if, if we had been provided with the accurate information, would have been three cents higher than what we calculated. So for every $100,000 of value, that equates to $30 in taxes. And the revenue per one cent of tax rate adjusted from what we had originally presented, which was just over $550,000 now, to just over $577,000. We, we do believe that it's important for us to provide this information to council as well as to the public to understand that we worked with the best of information that we had available at the time that was provided to us by both counties. And we wanted to make sure that there was an update to, understood, to understand where we are today. Mr. Horn. First of all, a statement that I think is important for everybody um, to, to know, and we as a city council have all been contacted by folks, I know the city's been contacted, but to make it clear, both uh, Edgecombe and Nash County are the ones that set the valuations of the property. The only thing that the city we have responsibility for is setting the tax rate. And so the evaluation of properties were a, a result of uh, each individual county going through their evaluation process in the city had nothing to do with that except for receiving the information and doing the best that we could do with setting the tax rate. And then now a question with that tax rate that we did set, um, if, if we wanted to reduce the, the tax rate, I would assume it's too late to do that. That is correct. Um, the Typically that you are only allowed to set the rate with the adoption of the budget, the conditions or an amendment are typically emergency conditions associated with either a natural disaster or a significant loss in revenue that results in having to raise it. I uh, have not been able to find any example where something like this would occur and you would be able to adjust the rate for this current fiscal year. Okay. Um, Councilman Jordan. So, for going forward, and you said if we had a known, we could have made a different projection. How do we make sure that we know in the future? I don't have an easy answer for that question at this point. Um, just as Council, as Vice and the Mayor Pro Temp said, um, the valuation process is completely run by the counties here in North Carolina. We as a municipality are not involved in that. And I think that what it would require is that when the next revaluation occurs, which right now would be eight years unless there's changes in the law, it is going to require us to be more observant and I would say advocate from the position that we can to make sure that things are being done properly and to the best of our abilities and that we can be aware. But it's not easy for us to be in a position to really audit what they are doing. And I don't mean that critically or negatively. It's just not a process that we as municipalities are involved in. Thanks, Mr. Harris. The two counties employ an outside firm to do all this. Correct. Was the same firm used in both counties? No, sir. Well, have we heard from each of these firms how these errors, are? I don't know if it's error or what, but have we heard how in the world did this big difference come about? We need, I would say at this point, we have we did not receive any notice of any indication of, of, of the variance. It was calculated by our staff. Um, 
there could be a multitude of reasons. And I just simply don't, I don't want to say anything because it would be speculative at this time. How about Wilson and other counties? Have you heard if they went through and realized their values were, I mean, $250 million is a yeah. big difference. Yes, sir, it is. And I cannot, I can't answer, I can't say that I've heard anything with respect to other counties. Yes. Ah. Yes, but not. Even during the time we was talking about revenue neutral, um, I believe I asked you a question of other municipalities, even the ones that were close, closer to us. Uh, we couldn't find not one city that balanced their budget on revenue neutral. Correct. Then I had a call with the county commissioner which very seldom we agree, he said, you are right, because no way in the world how Rocky Mountain is going to be able to operate if you do revenue neutral. Um, even uh, prior uh, administration did not give us the good information to even evaluate what we want to set our tax rate at. Because we look now, it's 6.4 and 9.9 deficit. Uh, if we have known that, we probably it probably been different than what we did set the tax rate. But do you know of any city in North Carolina who adopt their budget on revenue neutral? I honestly don't at this moment, a city that went through revaluation. There were some cities that didn't go through revaluation who kept their tax rates the same. I, I think there may have been one or two, but I don't know their names off the names right. of the jurisdictions off the top of my head because we did do this survey. Right. Um, it was, what I will say is obviously that the budget was prepared based on direction to set it at revenue neutral. And to your point, it was a situation which obviously puts you in a different spot than if you are able to incorporate to present a, re a recommendation of a tax increase. Obviously, council can choose to tell us to, to go back and adjust it downward. But I mean, the real issue here is that even the revenue neutral rate that we set was off by three cents, and that to, and I mean that's that's the concern I have because if it had been half a cent, one cent, we understand that. But at three cents, that's a noticeable adjustment. Well, thank you for the information. I don't think there's much we can do with it except for share the information with the public and um, move forward. So, um, Mr. Turner, I get, do you have the next part? Or uh, I didn't have one other comment. Um, Mr. Hodder, uh, going back to what Councilman Harris said about the store, uh, those are three things. You mentioned one about contract. Several times we mentioned things that were not in line with city policy. Um, compensation for employees receiving um, higher education, uh, employees receiving pay increases before their uh, performance, uh, before their uh, one year. Uh, one year uh, probation, and, um, and you mentioned the contract. So those have been mentioned over and over, and how those things were not in line with what the council had adopted. And those things should be restored. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on any of this finance? On the subject of contracts, I wanted to bring to you um, what uh, where we stand with the uh, long-range long planning process for land use development. There is a contract that had been awarded by the prior administration, I think, uh, sometime back in January. Uh, progress has been made on, on that study. I wanted to bring that study to you so you can see um, what was contemplated by that, what's the outcome of that study, and then also how far along we are in the study. And uh, so we're going to see that. And then uh, if we can have that discussion, and then what I'd like to do is come back and talk about what, what we're really looking for in, in a long-range plan. So 
I'm going to call on uh, Emily Kingston, and she has with her Colleen Wilder, who is a representative from AECOM, that can talk about what it is we they are doing. What, what are we doing in imagining the Rocky Mountains? Thank you, Mr. Barney. I'm Emily Kingston, Director of Development Services, and I'm joined by Colleen Wilger, our uh, representative from AECOM. I'm going to start by um, going over some basics about a comprehensive plan, you know, what, what a comprehensive plan is, and, and why uh, we're moving forward with um, creating a new comprehensive plan for the city, and then um, introduce AECOM, and then describe where we are in the process of the comprehensive plan. So what a comprehensive plan is, is essentially it's a roadmap for the city's future. It establishes a long-term community vision that guides future growth and development. The intent is that it will guide orderly and coordinated growth as our city continues to grow and develop. And importantly, it is shaped by community input and needs that are identified by the community. It includes goals, policies, and implementation strategies for achieving the identified community's vision. And it serves as a guiding document that informs our policies, capital investments, zoning regulations, and so on. And I do want to describe the difference between a comprehensive plan and the city's land development code. A comprehensive plan is a guiding document. It serves as recommendations for how land is used, whereas a land development code or a zoning ordinance is regulatory in nature. It includes regulations for how land is used. And a comprehensive plan informs what those regulations are in the land development code. Why communities need a comprehensive plan? As a condition of adopting and applying the zoning regulations, the state of North Carolina requires that local governments adopt and reasonably maintain a comprehensive plan or land use plan. And the term reasonably maintain is not uh, defined within the state statute, um, but it does, you know, it, it does um, reference that we should be updating that plan. Um, but I do want to emphasize that it's more than just a state statute that we have a plan um, for uh, implementing zoning regulations. Comprehensive plans are about planning for people, establishing a unified vision forward, and guiding orderly growth and development. The city's current comprehensive plan is the Together Tomorrow Tier 1 Smart Growth Plan, which was adopted in 2003, a little over uh, 20 years ago. Um, other than providing ongoing guidance for rezoning requests and capital investments, there have been a number of um, items that have been implemented or adopted um, after that plan or as a result of that plan, and those include but aren't limited to appearance and design standards within the city's land development code which are applied to development along our major corridors um, the strengthening of our floodplain regulations and achievement of crs class 6 designations and that designation affords discounts on flood insurance rates for those in our community that are required to carry flood insurance because they're located within a floodplain um, affordable housing zoning incentives have been added to our land development code, and those include um, affordable housing density bonuses, reduced parking for affordable housing developments, and so on. Construction of bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure was a recommendation in uh, our current plan and has, of course, um, come to fruition. Um, in addition to the City of Rocky Mount pedestrian plan, which was adopted in 2012, and the City of Rocky Mountain Bike Plan, which was adopted in 2018. Several neighborhood parks have been improved, including Battle, Meadowbrooks, Holly Street Parks, and then the development of the Rocky Mount Sports Complex and the Imperial Center for the Arts and Sciences was a recommendation and, of course, has been developed um, since adoption of this plan. As the current plan is aging, uh, Rocky Mount does need a new plan to establish an updated long-term vision that addresses our current needs and can provide relevant, up-to-date guidance for growth and development. The development of a comprehensive plan requires an extensive amount of time and resources and expertise to develop. So most communities do work with uh, professional planning firms to help them uh, build capacity and to create these plans. So AECOM, which is a planning, engineering, and design firm, was selected for our project, and they were selected based on 
uh, work that they've done in the region, specifically the work that they did in Richmond, Virginia, which was awarded the 2021 Daniel Burnham Award for Comprehensive Plans from the American Planning Association. I serve as the project manager from the city side for Imagine Rocky Mount, um, and then we have a project team of staff from the city that works together to continue to move this effort forward. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Colleen to introduce AECOM and their role in the project. Hi, good afternoon. Hold on one second. Catherine Jordan. So on that team, is there anybody from the community? Oh, so. Um, I think we're going to get to that. We are, and I was referring just to our internal city staff that's working with um, AECOM, but yes, there is a steering committee, and yes, we will get to that. Okay. I, I had one before. So, so AECOM wanted to be for to do the comprehensive study. So, with several firms that that you know of. So there was not an RFP for bidding process for this project. And why was that? Um, that was the the wishes of previous administration. Okay, thank you. So it's a seg perfect segue um, to the work that we're doing. Good evening, I'm Colleen Wilger. I'm with the ACOM team. I, as Emily said, she's the project manager for the city staff side. I'm the project manager for the consultancy side. Um, and one of the first things that we do in our approach to these types of plans is we set up an equity framework and it helps with decision making. So we ask ourselves who needs to be involved and how are they involved throughout the process and how are we checking away with that? That's the procedural equity and the distributive equity talks about how are things um, getting distributed throughout the process and the plan itself and the actions and the goals and then the restorative equity is sort of just acknowledging what is is that the planning profession has done in the community and how we can work with the community to move beyond that and um, work with communities for their needs today. We've done work throughout North Carolina. Emily mentioned Richmond, um, but we've, we've done work with your neighbors. We actually worked with all of you in the 2016-2014 um, Rocky Mount Master Plan for the Parks and Rec. Um, and I think some of the improvements that Emily mentioned were incorporated from that master plan into the comp plan. So all of these things work together. Um, and this is a component of our work as well as the community engagement. You'll hear a lot of us talk about that. And then the technical components as well. Um, so that's just something that we wanted to share with you about the local work. But the contract, I think, is something that was of interest. The work is spread out across each path. Um, Project management is one of the first ones. This is just general tracking of the project, tracking, making sure the tasks are being done, making sure that everything is done on schedule and within budget. There's integrated engagement, um, and that just means that there's engagement across all of the tasks. So we're meeting with the community at every step of the way. Um, we're meeting with various stakeholders, and um, we have a steering committee that um, I think Emily was referencing earlier. We'll get to that as well in this presentation. We have an existing conditions analysis, and this is us just understanding the current body of work that you have, the existing plans, the past plans, what has been already implemented, what's already um, sort of on track to get taken forward, and we incorporate that into this plan so you're not re redo redoubling efforts. Um, and then we also look at a market assessment and look at trends and projections to inform how the city is going to grow so that we can understand how the land should be used. And then there's a visioning task, has four, that's going over guiding principles, um, working with the community, and understanding what this long-term vision could look like, um, and if there's any themes. And then we have the land use policy um, scenario plan. This is where we look at different growth <coughs> projections and understand how those different growth scenarios could inform the final plan. So you would select what the preferred alternative is, and that's how you move forward. And we have implementation. This is where um, sort of the rubber meets the road. There is, as part of this work, a code review for the land development code to make sure, like Emily said, the comprehensive plan and the regulations with one another. So if you have a new comprehensive plan, you want your regulations to be consistent with that. So we're looking at your um, existing land development code against the, what the recommendations of this comprehensive plan will be, and then understanding are there any adjustments that need to be made in those regulations, and if there are, We'll give the staff a roadmap to figure out how to do that. 
We're also going to have an implementation workshop and a strategy for how these policies and actions can get done. Um, we'll be working with the different departments throughout the city to understand what's allocated as far as resources for the projects and the actions that are being recommended and if it's feasible. And we'll be providing um, timelines, sort of short-term, mid-term, long-term, to see how that works out. Because comp plans do inform budgets, um, and they inform resource allocation and operations of cities as well. So this is sort of how do things get done, and that's what we'll be providing to you as well, roadmap of how to get it done. And then the draft and final plan, that's just that's a lot of writing and working on the recommendations themselves. And then we have adoption, where we'll be presenting draft recommendations and getting feedback from all the different stakeholders and making adjustments so that all of you can have a plan that you are able to legislate and get approved and adopted. So how this works out as far as what it translates into project phases is we've broken up those eight tasks across five phases. So we've shown this a lot. Um, it's on the project website. But where we are right now is we've just we're in the very beginning. Um, we've done the first phase. It's um, sort of what we imagine. It's going out and asking people, what do you love about Rocky Mount? What would you like to carry forward? Um, what would you like to see change if you could imagine it 25 years from now? Um, and we've had public engagement. We've done that existing conditions analysis, like I said, to understand from a data side. Does the data match the lived experience of the community members? Because it is community-based. Um, so we want to make sure that we're listening and hearing from the community to understand what, what Rocky Mount really needs. And then we have the, our shared values in the community. This is what we've just started. This is where we're looking at all those um, pieces of feedback from the engagement, and we're trying to understand what are the community values, what are the themes, what are the goals that are most important for Rocky Mount <coughs> to understand that will inform the rest of the plan and the different policies that we need to really focus on. And then we have the third phase. This is the middle. It's the our plan for the future. This is where that those draft recommendations are starting to get formulated. And we're going to be going out and testing with the community. Does this make sense? Did we hear you? At every step of this, at each of these phases, there is engagement. Like I said, remember that task two where there's integrated engagement. Every step of this phase, of these phases, has engagement. And before we start each one, we're going back to say, did we hear you right? Does this make sense? Does this represent what you told us? And that's where we are right now in phase two. That's why I said we haven't quite kicked it off because we still are in that report back period. But this is what we heard and collected in phase one. Um, does it sound right? Does it make sense to you? And then the fourth phase is how we get there together. And this is where we're actually establishing those specific policies and actions that you'll start to see in your daily work as a council member. Um, and this is where it's going to start guiding those future capital investments for Rocky Mount. This is where you'll start seeing the implementation pieces come together as well. And then the final phase is advancing the legislative process. So working with all of you, working with the various the planning commission and the other advisory boards and the steering committee as well to make sure that everything the community has said along the way is reflected and shaped in the document in front of you to read. I'll hand it off to Emily to talk about the steering committee. So there is a steering committee that's guiding uh, the development of this plan. The, the roles of the steering committee are to encourage participation in the planning, uh, planning process within their own networks and to continue to spread the word and encourage people to participate, share content and the calendar of events with their network, and then contribute to the plan, help identify what the current issues in Rocky Mount are, help inform what the future goals should be, and review draft material. <coughs> We've had two steering committee meetings to date. The first was held in early May, and the agenda of that meeting included describing what a comprehensive plan is, similar to what we discussed early in this presentation, a project overview of the phases that we would be walking through, the roles and responsibilities of the steering committee, um, and then an overview of the public launch <coughs> that occurred in May, which was our first push for public engagement. And then we met again at the end of July. Uh, we um, discussed an overview of the existing conditions analysis. We reviewed the phase one engagement and the feedback that we received during that engagement period. And then a discussion of some of the themes that we're hearing from the public. And then a phase, an overview of phase two, which is the phase that comes next. 
This is a list of steering committee membership. Uh, we have representatives from the Planning Board, the Redevelopment Commission, the Central City Revitalization Panel, the Historic Preservation Commission, the Mayor's Commission on Persons with Disabilities, Workforce Housing Advisory Commission, um, the Rocky Mount Area Chamber of Commerce, the Carolina's Gateway Partnership, Edgecombe County Public Schools, Nash and Edgecombe Community College, both, the Rocky Mount Area Association of Realtors, North Carolina Wesleyan University, the Housing Authority, and Nash County Travel and Tourism, and Edgecombe County Tourism and their Chamber of Commerce. And these individuals, these um, organizations were chosen um, because they represent kind of a high level perspective and a broad perspective of the needs and um, uh, of the needs of growth and development within the community. Um, and they bring that, that high level perspective into the uh, conversation. Um, thank you for this. I don't see representation from the inner 14 uh, community groups that would have meetings month to month to keep their community address of this. And I don't know if it's too late, but I would love to see some more in depth from community, I know the, the housing piece, but those 14 communities to get more representation more, be more at the table in this process. Well, if I could just tack on to that, uh, I'd also like to see some major employers. You know, they're 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 having to recruit folks, bring them into Rocky Mountain, yeah. and they also represent uh, shareholders that are not necessarily yeah. represented in this group. Yeah. So, and also when we went through, um, I don't, I'm not sure if it was together tomorrow or another community-wide planning effort. Um, because of the range and scope and the impact of the process, uh, we also uh, created big opportunities for dialogue, you know, and it could have been later in the phase, and perhaps you already have that planned somewhere, um, but, but I do think it's important, um, in addition to receiving feedback from the, the big questions that you have, that you also have people who have particular sector interests, you know, who might want to be able to weigh in in the conversation um, so that the policy that comes out of at the end um, has the full engagement of the entire community. I mean, literally, at the end of that process, we had thousands of people involved. And it was a big, it was a big shift to shift, but it was easy to shift because everybody knew the same information. And, and I would, you know, also feel, I mean, you say that something very important. You said, you know, the first point in the planning process, determining who was important to be heard. And um, I think that, um, thank you, Emily, for your, I think, trying your best to work within what was given to you to work with, to be inclusive in the community, at least in planning um, and implementing some of the um, stakeholder uh, engagement with some of the community meetings. And I also feel, um, Mr. Interim, that um, we should be as a city council at least updated. If we're, if our opinion is not desired, you know, which I don't know why it wouldn't be, but at least we should be updated on a regular basis before um, these processes end in the phases and the stages. Um, so I think, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to have this discussion dialogue because at least we're hearing, you know, what's taking place and can either agree, disagree, or add to whatever it is that needs to be added to because we do, we should have a voice as well as all of the people that we are representing. You can go ahead and respond. Oh, okay. So thank you. I know there's a lot coming <laughs> yeah. no, Okay, this is great. I'm really grateful for the feedback. Um, I did want to mention the steering committee is one component of who we're engaging. Um, so anytime we hear like talk to these people, we're writing it down because we want to engage as many people as possible, which Emily will talk about in a little bit. Um, so this is one group, and then we are supplementing with those big opportunities, like you said, and then we're supplementing with smaller ones too, so that 
there's a format people feel comfortable coming to or they're that are more accessible and approachable that's what we want to do we want to provide a wide variety of opportunities so we can get a wide variety of people coming so we can get as many voices shaping this event as possible did you take your lead yes. uh, she just uh, i was going to ask what uh, black would ask but you answer my question okay councilman tj walker thank you um and thank you both again uh and if we could uh, create a space for um, young people ages 18 and under. Um, we have a youth council here, but uh, it's, 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 it makes sense to me uh, just to have a future plan uh, to be able to have the future actually at the table. So thank you. Councilman Harris. Yeah, uh, I wanted, I just like to get as much background information, factual information. Uh, uh, Mr. Barney, for a contract this size, when you were with the city all these years and previous as interim manager and now currently as interim manager. Has it been a customary practice for us to just not issue RFPs for a contract this size? The customary practice uh, is to issue an RFP so that you can invite uh, firms in who are in this business and um, and then you know narrow the list of applicants down to two or three or four or five and then and then come to this body with a recommendation for engaging engagement. So that's, that's, that's typically what we have done in the past. Uh, ACOM, y'all have done a number of these studies over here. Is it customary that y'all begin this study and not have any preliminary meeting with the city council? So the way we work is we work with the client, which would be city staff, and we ask them, who, are, who should we engage with, and we come up with a strategy. And in this instance, the strategy was shared between staff and AECOM. Um, it is typical that council gets engaged with from the beginning, and the decision-making bodies that are going to be part of the decision-making authority get engaged as part of the process. That is typical. Thanks. I hope this is okay, but since our, our former manager is not here, I would like to ask Ms. Hill why the council as a group was not consulted or engaged. I heard the word engagement throughout your presentation. How were we not engaged as a full council? That might be the, the way I would answer that is that the prior administration and the prior manager uh, took it on his, himself to go in and, and award a contract. Uh, I don't know about the de definition of the scope of work, uh, how that was done, but but you can see, I think I included the yeah, contract, you sure. can see it, it, was, uh, it was done administratively. And our policy says that any contract that is, award, that is contemplated that would be more than um, $90,000 would come to the city council. So you would see and if, for a project like this, before we even get to the contract size, the contract uh, amount, we, we would be talking to the city council members about the need for a study. That what was you, my what question. In it, what's the scope of work? How big do you want it? How little do you want it? All of that. You all would help define what the scope is, then send us out to go with our people looking for Prior to developing the Right. Well, that was my you, question. You be involved in it before you even get the contract. <clears throat> Well, that was my question to Ms. Hill. Why were we not as a collective body? I don't know that she's going to be able to answer that. I think the answer would be provided by the prior manager. Councilman Blackwell? Um, the, just, the conversation I had was just hell. The question that I was going to ask of Peter is, and I, just from my memory, I already know the answer because I've been here. You know, It was always customary that management bring to us whatever their priority items, issues, concerns were, which is certainly their role and their job to do, along with the recommendation of what the process should be, which is their role to do. And the city council and the mayor would have an opportunity to weigh into that conversation and discussion, which is our role to do, and give direction to the manager about how we wanted to proceed, which is our role to do. So what's clear is that this process, regardless of how great the work has been or who has been engaged, it's clear that this process, which we have brought up prior to this moment in time, 
um, has not held with the policies and procedures that the city of Rocky Mount has always been involved in, at least for over the last 20 years. And I don't know of any municipality that would have um, done things in this manner, especially with an $800,000 contract that would impact the city for the next 20 years. So I don't, this is not um, meant to um, berate anyone here. We just stated what the facts are, is that we have not been involved or engaged up front. That people in the community, even to the appointment of the steering committee, knew more about the process than the city council did that authorizes contracts and authorizes budgets to be sent. And when we asked the information about process, it was told to us that the adherence was to the state general statute. And when we question why is this not focused on what our ordinance that all the council has adopted, um, there was never any clarity around that. And I think, am I correct? I mean, that's already a matter of public record. It's been discussed. It's in the record. And the conversations have been held. And I appreciate the fact that today, we're standing here having the conversation that we should have had a year ago. But I thank you for being here today, and thank you for your work. Thank you. Uh, I mentioned about decision making. Uh, we are the decision making body uh, that makes decisions uh, prior to going to staff. And when I look at this, you talk about a um, equity framework. Um, but when you get to the steering committee, we say high-level thinking, and we're not including or inclusive uh, when it comes to the grassroots citizens in our community. Uh, we planted something 20 years, and I would be 75. And all of us represent different wars in this city. We all have hopefully the same goal. We bring different aspects and people to the table to craft a vision that we all can live by. And we ask numerous of times about a steering committee. Some of these people I don't know, I don't have to know everybody, but some of the people that I do know have not been asked to sit at the table. And uh, as a body, uh, this contract was brought up more than once, and we didn't act on it. And so hopefully today that we can decide on where we are and where we're going to try to go with it. Because a very important step, even the first step of a comprehensive plan, without including the council, it's a huge mistake. And, I, and, and, and you know, we have uh, the representative here, and I was, I was glad to hear you say that in some of your uh, work that you agreed that council members or the body um, are included on the front end, because I don't see anywhere in this document that even states anything about the council, I guess, at the end of number seven. How many steps is it? There's eight. Eight. So I guess the council, oh, we'll be number eight. We would be eight. So it's like we're on the back end of this whole comprehensive plan. And if we do decide to go forward with it, I would hope you would go back um, to whomever you um, report to uh, with our concern how we can be inserted as soon as possible uh, to be brought up today and to hear us collectively as a body uh, what we would like to see in the comprehensive plan as well. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Walker, I can agree with Councilman Knight on, I guess, you say phase one, if we could, I guess just highlight some of the good information you got out of it. Come and bring that back to council 
I guess now you you said you're about to begin phase two, so we could get a brief before you go out for phase two. This is where we're going. This is how we're doing it. And I think that would help council, you know, decide to go on. But I think that's kind of where we are, and I think that would be important too because, like you said, we have seven wards. Everybody have a different perspective, but we're all trying to get to the same goal. So I think that can also help balance things out and can also be helpful for us, but also helpful for you guys going out too. So. Thank you. You guys are nice. We have a bit of a brief for you. All right. Yes. Question by the mayor. Or well, if you got a brief, I'll wait for that then. Because my question is going to go back to, you know, how are we defining equity uh, and where are we in the process and what have you heard? And uh, so, so anyway, I'll tee you up with that then. Great, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. And no, we didn't court your craft this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Chair, the steering committee is only one part of a robust public engagement effort. Um, as part of phase one engagement, we attended 18 pop-up engagements, which is where we popped up at community events that were already scheduled. So uh, we attended the farmer's market, downtown live, Juneteenth, uh, all three days of the Juneteenth event. Um, some business owners were um, generous enough to allow us to come into their businesses over the lunch and uh, breakfast hours so we could engage with their customers. So we're grateful to that. Um, so we had 18 pop-up engagements. We had four citywide visioning workshops as well, um, where we, um, this was at the end of the phase one engagement, but where we invited the city to come and reflect on what we've heard during the pop-up engagements and then start to understand and discuss um, what the greatest needs are and how we move forward from here. Uh, we also attended a number of neighborhood meetings and other community events as well to uh, to collect as much feedback as we could. And through that phase one engagement, we had um, over 3,000 uh, views on our project website because I did fail to just now say that we had a project website that had an online survey as well, which was another way that we engaged those who we were unable to engage with in person. Um, there were uh, 700 pop-up event participant interactions. We had 700 um, items of feedback at those pop-up events. Um, over 1,200 comments at the pop-ups. We had um, over 260 participants in the online survey, and we had 100 participants at the four visioning workshops as well. Um, so this is a good start. We're, we're happy with this amount of engagement, but we're not done. We want to keep engaging and keep inviting people to, to invite us in so we can continue to have conversations and learn from the public about the needs that they have in the community. Um, in terms of what we've been hearing so far, at the pop-up event, we asked three questions. We asked, what do you love about Rocky Mount today? What you'd like to see more of in Rocky Mount? And then in 2050, which is our planning horizon for this project, what do you imagine Rocky Mount to be? And what you love about Rocky Mount today, we heard that people love the small town feel and the sense of community. They like the history and culture of Rocky Mount and the people. They love the community events that bring people together. They like its regional location. They enjoy the mill, less traffic. They like the parks, trails, and greenways that our parks department manages. They like the downtown, the new restaurants that are coming in, and that it's home. What they'd like to see more of in Rocky Mount, improvements to public safety, more growth, revitalization of our downtown, adding more dining and entertainment options, more activity for youth and teens, and actually seniors as well, um, more walkable access to our commercial destinations and community facilities, so walkability generally, economic and educational opportunities, housing and commercial revitalization, more affordable housing, and they love the parks and greenways and they want more of it. So more parks and greenways, especially in our neighborhoods. And then when asked what they imagine Rocky Mount to be, a city with a high quality of life, a big city with a small town character, more balanced growth across our two counties, safe, clean, and family oriented, more jobs, more businesses, affordable with diverse housing options, revitalized commercial and residential areas, we want Rocky Mount to be a destination, more walkable, bikeable, more unified, forward thinking, and thriving. And on the online survey, we asked similar but uh, more questions uh, to dig a little bit deeper with those respondents. 
Um, again, what they love about Rocky Mount is their neighbors and the community, the trails, parks, open spaces, um, where they felt areas of improvement that were most important, public safety, new business and industry, more jobs and workforce training opportunities, again, more parks, playgrounds, and open space, environmental sustainability, and housing affordability, and more housing options. Speaking specifically about the downtown, residents would like to see more shopping and dining opportunities, better upkeep of our commercial buildings downtown, more community programming, and well-maintained public spaces for gathering. Speaking specifically about neighborhoods and what they'd like to see there, improved walkability, parks, playgrounds, and recreation facilities within neighborhoods, a variety of housing types, health and wellness facilities, and safer sidewalks and pedestrian crossings as well. Um, and then simil similarly, greatest needs in Rocky Mount, safety, jobs, beautification, housing, education, and greatest needs for neighborhoods, safety, walkability, housing, trees, and green <coughs> spaces. And the feedback that I just shared here was from the online survey and the pop-ups, but it is very consistent with what we've been hearing at the visioning workshops and our other engagements as well. So that brings us to phase two and the next steps. So now that we've started phase two, um, we're sharing input, or we're going to share input that we received during phase one and seek feedback on a draft vision statement, um, draft themes, and goals. So we're currently synthesizing what we've heard and we'll be developing those drafts for public feedback. And we're going to continue engaging with the community. We've, um, we're encouraging people to invite us to their board meetings and their group meetings, and we've sent um, emails and social media requests to invite us in so we can have curated conversations about topics that are of interest to your group or organization or you individually so we can understand that need and how that need might be reflected in the comprehensive plan. So continuing to have a dialogue so we understand the needs of the community. And we'll also be having a series of stakeholder focus groups where employers and, and other um, stakeholders within the community would be engaged to have more specific conversations about the topics that are of interest to them. Um, we'll be identifying areas of opportunity um, as a mapping exercise within the community and then develop key performance indicators, so performance measures. So how can we um, gauge our, our success um, as we move forward with, with this after we understand what our goals and our mission statement is. So that's a brief overview of phase one, and I'm happy to answer additional questions as well. So, so Mayor, did that answer your question? Mostly. Um, it really, it was more, you're talking about an equity defined process. And so, you know, what are you looking for there? I mean, what's the math behind that? I mean, is it data? I mean, is it opinion? Is it data? Just walk me a little bit more through that in detail because, you know, it means a lot of things to a lot of people. And, and I'm in favor of equity, but I don't know what it means in this context. That's fair. So it's a lot of different things. Sure. So in the engagement process, what we're looking at, like we said, is engaging as many people as possible. Tracking that through numbers, but also where we're where we're engaging them. Um, so we're being very considerate and thoughtful about making sure that we're engaging edge home residents early and often, and putting sure. resources there. As same as Nash, so we're trying to be as distributed throughout the city. Um, and then we're also uh, trying to figure out and track when people respond online. How are they responding? So we've asked them to enter their zip code. Um, we have gotten some feedback that there are some zip codes that are better than others and understanding where those breakdowns are. Um, we've tried to figure out are there ways to um, unpack that a little bit more. And it's tricky, I will say it's tricky here because of like where the cell phone towers are. So right now the zip code is what we thought people would be easy to identify for them. They might not know where their board is. Um, so that's what we're doing right now. I will say we've, we've organize the scope of work in our contract to be very nimble and flexible and responsive to what's working and what's not working. So if we're understanding the, that data um, and it's not contributing to the people that we know are hard to reach, like some of the folks you've identified that aren't at the table right now, we'll go out and make sure that they're gathered in and that they provide feedback. So that's what the engagement part. What equity means for policy and embedding it in like the legislation that you'll see, that document that you'll get at the end of all of this, 
equity means what are the outcomes going to be? How are the policies going to be equitably in implemented? How are they going to be equitably invested? And what does that look like for Rocky Mount? And that's something we have to work through together with the stakeholders, with staff, with how they operate, and with all of you and what works. So the policies itself, from an equity standpoint, um, we're finding out what's important to Rocky Mount. It might be more of a strategic plan, um, or it might be more of a land use plan, or it might be a combination. The way the contract is set up again, it's very nimble and flexible because it's community driven. So whatever Rocky Mount needs, that's what the policy areas will shape and define and focus on. Does that answer your question? So we don't know yet. Not yet from a, a policy standpoint. Mm -hmm. right. From That's a policy fine. standpoint, not yet. I can tell you what we've heard so far, the big issues. Yeah. So we've heard affordable housing. We've okay. heard redeveloping or like reinvigorating downtown because it's beautiful and people love it. Um, we've heard capitalizing on the parks and greenways. People are really loving those and the investments you're already doing there. They want they want to see more of that. Um, we've heard, like we said, public safety, but we thought that should be embedded throughout because once you do these things, sure. safety will improve. Um, feel free to expand if I'm missing anything. But those have been like the top things. We've heard about economic development and capitalizing on a lot of the investments that you've already made throughout the city. Um, we've heard about downtown, but then there's also other commercial nodes throughout the city that also need um, to be included in that like growth management plan. And then we've talked about sort of what it looks like when you're developing outside in those other neighborhoods and how do they get connected and how do people have goods and services when they haven't had goods and services for a long time. So making sure those assets and sort of that what we would call as planners civic infrastructure, like what makes a community a community, making sure they're also distributed and um, able to be in the neighborhood. That helps a lot. Thank okay. you. Uh, yeah, I was a similar question to the mayor's on, but maybe looking forward. So that means, or does this mean, then at the step number five of your process, land use and policy scenario plan, that this could be a revamp of the zoning ordinances? Is that what we're talking about? Where does it, we're talking about possible overlays in certain districts? throughout the city? Is that what we're talking about? Not yet. Maybe. We're talking about a future land use map. Okay. That is the step before all of that. So it's how is land used, where should the growth be located? Okay. And then the zoning ordinance, your land development code, we are looking at that to understand how that relates to this comp plan and the property areas. So there might be future changes to that in development code. So, and I'm just, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, if no, I no, 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 please, 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 um, please. A future land use map is different than a zoning map. A future okay. land use map is a, a guiding map that shows where the community would like to see growth and, wh and where you would like to see certain land uses. So when you're reviewing uh, rezoning requests, mm -hmm. the future land use map is a primary guiding document for you as, as you're making decisions. Um, and what we would need to have happen is the comprehensive, the, the zoning regulations, the land development code, that's how we implement, or one of the ways that we implement a comprehensive plan. So we would want those regulations to reflect the needs and priorities of the comprehensive plan. So we certainly anticipate updates to the to the land development code after um, the results of this plan, but we just don't know yet what those are because we're still working through the process. So that that sort of leads me back to where I was trying to envision we would start from, because it seems to me, if I'm correct that when the planning board and the board of adjustment uh, make whatever decisions they make in any of those decisions, mostly from the planning board, comes to city council. It usually references together tomorrow, section 10.1B3 or something like that. So, so <laughs> you know, whatever it is. But it's a clear tie back that goes back to the will of the public on a document that the city council has embraced and adopted. And it's a clear pathway to how we make decisions, even if we have to create variances because of whatever <laughs> circumstance came up, there's still a baseline of understanding that some process created. So are we saying that 
or do we know yet? Are we saying that at the end of this process we'll have that kind of clarity or are we still considering where the policy impacts will be and how they be how they'll be worked out? At the end of this process, the goal is to have those policy statements so that planning commission and other advisory boards can look at them and make their decisions based on them. Um, and you can be able to make that connection, like you said, it might not be, it might be imagine Rocky Mount policy area, blah, 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 but it will be a new policy area and it will inform the decisions you're making with your new vision. Councilman Harris? Yeah, uh, the mayor made a comment earlier that I just want to expand on. It takes money in order to do the things that we want to aspire to accomplish. In your past with working with the city of Richmond and other municipalities, can you go into what specific kinds of engagement you had with local business and industry? Sure. Because that's where the biggest revenue potential source is. Yes. So and the mayor was spot on. We need to consult with our major employers. Yeah. So hopefully you've come to we are including major employers, business owners, downtown business um, investors even. Um, as part of this contract, we have downtown engagement identified even um, as separate. So we know it's extra special. We know that's an area of interest and an area of a focus. So we do have even just one um, strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and threat to SWAT a workshop um, set aside just for downtown. But then we have citywide business as well. Um, we have new uh, business ventures going on as well, and so we will be engaging with those stakeholders to understand what's bringing you to Rocky Mount, what um, is bringing your employees to Rocky Mount, what are you hearing from your employees that they need, um, and how are those investments going to happen. Um, we also have, like we said, that market and trends analysis and assessment to understand are there other opportunities that aren't at the table now um, that potentially could be or they're desired to be. For instance, we've heard that there's a desire potentially to have a hotel downtown. So we're looking at what does that look like? Um, you have your event center, which is fantastic. How do we keep people after they have an event downtown to the fantastic restaurants and then stay overnight and do some shopping? That's the type of thing that we're looking into. So we'll be talking to those business investors and um, that economic sector, the various economic sectors to understand what's working, what they'd like to see more of. Would that be one-on-one -on -one with some of the major employers or? Group discussion, how do you go about it? It'll be various formats. So I think right now we're looking at small groups, but we have had some one-on-ones. They've come to some of our pop-up events as well. Um, and so we're taking information however we can, to be honest. Um, but that uh, SWAT workshop that I said, that is a small group discussion specifically for downtown. But like I said, downtown is just one area. So we will be looking at other opportunities as well. So however their schedules, allow we're working with staff they're doing engagement just like we are so if we can't do it in our our engagements we're keeping track of that and we're making sure staff can supplement them so we're getting the information that everyone needs so along with the same discussions about downtown and other parts of the community one of our biggest investments recently has been the, the 336 acres off of 95 and we're having a new exit off by 95 um, in addition to the needs over there is this going to incorporate any of that in in there? And and being so new, how how do you go about engaging the the public with with that whole piece right there? Because that's a whole area that's going to be transformed within itself just just with that particular exit coming off 95 and the addition of the land that we acquired recently. Right. I'm happy to answer, and then the yes. staff can fill in. So. A lot of times what we do when there's ongoing discussions, and some of them can be sensitive, some of them aren't, some of them are very public. A lot of times we'll identify that as an area of opportunity, which I think you saw we're coming up to that in phase two. Sort of, we're just going to highlight that on the map and say we're watching this area. There's discussions going on currently, um, and what we'll do is we'll follow that in parallel with this process. Um, sometimes we'll engage with the stakeholders if city, if city staff are comfortable and council are comfortable with that depending on how those conversations are going. We don't want to be um, derailing any business ventures that are happening. So that's why we're always sensitive and making sure that we're coordinated when we do reach out to folks. 
Um, but right now, what we would do is identify that as an area of opportunity, track what's being discussed, and then follow it along the way of the process and make sure that it's um, getting updated as those conversations and those land acquisitions progress. Okay. Any, Mr. Warren, you got can, can I offer a couple of thoughts, I guess, at this stage? Sure. As I, as I kind of process this, one thought would be, you can see all the engagement and, and, the, and the train are rolling down the tracks. This process has begun, and, and it will lead to a, uh, an outcome that has more to do with land use and land development and, and land planning, that, that kind of thing. That's, that's one thing. And uh, if you want to continue that, I guess I'm looking for director. We want to continue that or not. And if we do, I think I'd like to have a chance to maybe talk about the price a little bit to see if we could bring a contract back to you for your approval so we, so we can be in conformance with our own policies with respect to contract award. A second thought about it is, when I was here last time, some of you had come to me individually and said what you'd like to see is a strategic plan. Uh, and I'm seeing, I think I'm seeing some elements uh, in, I guess, some of the early feedback that we get. A strategic plan to me means, uh, you know, a high level view of, um, of the future for this area. You know, what, what do we think is really important? Obviously, some of the ones are downtown development, inner city neighborhood redevelopment, economic development. And so on, like that. You and you got some big things going on. The 336 acres out there on that side, and you got the mega site. Has a Natron is coming and going to bring a thousand employees and all of that. Those are those are big things that we need to process in some way. So, I guess I'm wondering if if it makes sense to uh, if you want to continue this is to revise the scope of the project to include uh, not just the land piece of it. But also more of a strategic plan, so you'd have some some sense of uh, what our what our priorities are as a community, uh, and, and, and that. And, and, and I think you've already got some of the feedback that would help um, guide that process. So I'd like to propose that um, we empower Peter with the um, authority to. Um, revise or review the existing scope uh, that has been defined to you, um, especially taking into account the many positive things that you've done, but also looking at being a little bit more specific about the outputs and um, the level of engagement in the process, as well as the price tag. Um, because I'll be honest, uh, Ms. Colleen, everybody's gagging on the price tag, okay, <laughs> at least on this side of the fence. Um, and, and I think that if we are, we're not trying to sabotage good work, but we want to ensure that uh, the work is appropriate, that it adheres to our city adopted uh, policies, city council adopted policies and processes, and really does give our community what I think you want to give to which is an accurate uh, presentation of solid growth for 25 years out that has everybody's perspective and the benefit of everybody involved and engaged. So I like, instead of us trying to chop it up here today with what we have, I like to ask everybody if we're comfortable with Peter having that conversation uh, and then coming back to us um, well, at some time. May I just add a little something to that? Sure. I, I'd like to see us commit to spending the day as council. That sounds wonderful. Mm -hmm. You know, just, just chopping up what it is that we yeah. do want, strategic comprehensive. I mean, I don't think there's any question that we need a plan and an update and a refresh. Right. I can't speak to the dollars. I can't speak to the process. I'm certainly not that guy, but I think we need that. But what I've heard today is that nobody really feels like they've had a part of it or at least an opportunity to speak to it. Okay. And I think that would go a long, 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 long way. I'll, I'll, I don't want to do it, but I'll commit a day of a moderated discussion to try to figure out what is, what is at least council priorities to help shape some of that conversation. And that will bring us back into compliance with what our process is doing. And, and I, mean, I'll, I can even do it tomorrow. I'll, I don't want to do it tomorrow, but, I'll, but I will. <laughs> TJ, yeah. yeah. And I've heard Council Blackwell and Mayor's suggestions are, you know, as we, I've, as we've been down, you know, this road with priorities before, 
my only hesitation in, in uh, I guess we're trying to take a, a straw vote now is that we all approved a million dollars uh, for this comprehensive plan. And now we're saying that we have some anxieties about the cost. So it makes me a little hesitant to vote on anything right now because if we approve a million dollar allocation for a comprehensive plan, um, what I mean, why did we do that? As a unanimous you know, personally, I never was comfortable with a million dollars, and I and I said that for the sake of trying to get along with everybody. I supported it. I questioned from the beginning why we were allocating a million dollars that was slated as well for housing and community development. Uh, we've never had a plan that cost this much money for outcomes that we weren't clear about. So I don't mind going on record because I stated that too. But again, this was at the beginning of a process, at the beginning of a new administration, without understanding that we wouldn't be included in the process before things got kicked off. Because we asked questions all along the way. These are not new questions. These are not new questions. So that's my, my, my thankfulness that we have put a hard stop so that we now can go back and do what we have normally done. And I still don't see why a day of conversation, a follow-up discussion with that um, has to uh, be uh, perceived as if we're going back. I just think we're trying to reset. I heard restore with the budget. I want to restore confidence in this body, in our administration confidence with our community that we're all part and engaged. That's that's my that's my rationale, my reason. Council Mark. Uh, yes, Councilman Walker's uh, statement, a million dollars, we've always been in question about it. And along the way it was understood, even though it was in the budget, uh, the manager will come back to us uh, after after a RFP RQ uh, was given and someone selected and that uh, that company will come to the council uh, with their scope of work and what our vision would be and what the process would be uh, this whole process that we just discussed uh, was negated purposely uh, and that's why we're here now and, and it sounds like to me we want to fix it and move forward but have more engagement with those who perhaps have not been at the table um, stakeholders grassroots and others and to uh, as Mr. Barney stated, maybe a strategic plan because we have different things throughout the city, the 336 acres, we have Kingsboro and the industry park and all of that, and the inner city that Mr. Uh, Councilman Dorner mentioned, the 14 underserved communities um, that should be a part of this. And I think that's a great idea that the mayor presented uh, to us, along with Councilman Blackwell and others, uh, to be engaged uh, now at phase two, not at phase eight, when it comes to an adoption that we have not been privy to. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement uh, with uh, the said. So do I hear a consensus to what Councilman Blackwell and the mayor have suggested, or? or <clears throat> For me, yes. Yes. I think we need to give uh, interim manager, Mr. Steve. Barney, a little bit of time to put his thoughts together and his ideas before we have this all day retreat. Okay. We Correct. need this retreat. Yeah. Right? But I think we need to give you some time so you can kind of help us be the moderator and, and the person that can keep us on path instead of going. All different things. So, 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 yeah. yeah. And I'll just say, you know, the, kind of where Councilman TJ I think is going is let's keep it going too. Though. 
let's not hit a it's not a pause button. This is a how do we accelerate the development? What does it look like on the other end? Yeah, I think my question was taken a little out of context. But my question was around saying that we wanted to look at the price. I think as Councilman Blackwell said, look at the price. Mm-hmm. My statement was we approved a million dollars. That was my statement. My statement wasn't around the process of where we are now. My statement is around financially saying that we're going to go back and look at the price that we've already approved of and wanting me to follow now saying, okay, we've approved of this is what was stated. We've approved of this knowing that it was not something we really agree with, knowing that it was too high or whatever our um, our actually concerns were, were about the pricing, um, which I didn't have a concern about. I think a million dollars was what market says to go out and find the, the brightest and the best to come back and make this happen for us. Um, but my thing now is to say, hey, w- wanting it to follow now to say, let's look at the price when the price has already been set. So we said a year ago, hey, we, we approved this. This is what we want to do, but it's not what we want to do. We want to prove it. How am I now to follow now a year later saying, well, now let's follow this. I mean, when, when will that change? Well, as well. Listen, oh. uh, first of all, that million dollars was supposed to be for three studies. I don't know if there's a second study underway or a third study underway, but let's peel back the onion a little bit. We approved the million dollars in the budget, but we expect our manager to follow admin policies and procedures. And I've got it right here. Are you not concerned that admin policies and procedures were not followed? I, I, I never said that. My question I asked you, are you concerned? Right, my right, my question right, was, right, was right, we approved, right, wait a no, 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 we approved I, a million I got dollars. The floor. I got the floor right now. You asked me a question. But you said you didn't. Okay, I answer, answer the question. Please. Okay, so we approved it. My thing as a council, we are our fiscal responsibility is to approve or not approve a budget. It's one of our major responsibilities. Our second responsibility is to hire or fire manager. Those are our, our two responsibilities as city council members. Those are our two responsibilities. I ask we approved a million dollars within the budget, responsibility number one of a city council. Now we're saying, let's go back after we approve it, saying, well, I don't know if we should approve that, but let's approve it. Now we're going to go back and say, let's look at a new, maybe a new price for this. I'm not I'm not understanding and asking us to follow. I'm fine with process, however we want to process it to get it done. My question is, we were already here a year ago. Now we're coming back saying, well, now, you know, let's, it, it may be to are, are we saying that? We shouldn't have voted on it because if we had an issue with the million dollars, why did we vote to approve it? We we did not vote for a specific contract. We voted for a million dollars for three contracts. I said we allocated a million dollars for comprehensive plan. That's what I said. You're changing. That was three contracts. Correct. Wait a minute. If maybe our RFP was sent out to five reputable firms, maybe ACME could have been awarded the contract. Maybe if they knew four others were bidding, that the contract amount could be less. We don't know. I've been in business all my life. And by golly, the more you go and ask for bids, the more competitive price ranges there could be. That's all I'm saying. But by golly, there's been an omission, a violation of policy. Are we just going to allow that to happen? Just like what I addressed earlier with personnel? We we have got to realize that by golly, and I know Mr. Varney, we as a council were not as heavily involved in the management and running this city like we should have been engaged from a council perspective. We are now trying to get back to where we want to be, where y'all were prior to my two years being on the council. But if, if something is violated, we have got to correct that because I don't want it to be in 
a year in audit report in the management letter. Uh, that w at least we've done something to correct it. We can't we can't bring back the water that's gone under the bridge, but we can do our best to try to correct the situation. Yeah, I think that that was my point. I, I never questioned the policy in the process. So well, I just stated it. I'm talking about financially. We're saying let's go. Councilman Blackwood just said well, let's go back because there were some issues financially. Are we now going back and say look, we need to go back and look financially what we need to do different? Mm -hmm. I never questioned the process of it. Well, can, can I pull this discussion back? And let's, let's, Councilman Blackwell made um, a recommendation and the mayor added on to that. Is there a consensus to, to, in, in, to allow Mr. Barney to go back and look? Is there, is there a consensus to allow that to happen? Yes, yes, yes. yes. But mm -hmm. any, any opposed to it? Well, let's have a so, so to, to move things, I, so have to, to, to move things along, Mr. Varney, I guess you've heard kind of what the consensus is. If you could go into that, and then when we get to having a day meeting, um, let, let's let's don't, Mr. Mayor, well, I appreciate you uh, offering up here tomorrow. Just being honest, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I don't know if that's feasible. No, so uh, give us a yeah, give us several dates time, that we yeah. can choose from. But but I think it's also. Um, I'm not sure if it was Blackwell or, or uh, Robertson that made the, the comment. Let's let's not put this thing necessarily on hold, but let's listen. I was offering Mar just to say let's get it on. Right. Let's let's make it a priority right. and keep and, it going. And one, one more comment towards this from Mr. Uh, Councilman Knight, and then we'll move on to uh, item five on the text amendment for fences. Yeah, I was going to say it seems it here to be a, a, a lack of. A Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, it appears to be a lack of understanding. Councilman Harris is exactly right. And it's also a notion, too, that we need to nip that in the bud. That once a council approves the budget, that the city manager and his staff can do whatever they want to do, regardless of administrative policy and regardless of the authority of this council and what council member Harris is saying that Mr. Barney should take this back and look at it and bring it back to us and Ruben stated that and then the mayor added a component to that but council member Walker because we approved something does not give anyone the authority over ninety thousand dollars to do anything, any contract. I never said that. Again. Okay. Most of y'all are saying so. Okay. okay. All right, we got. It. Okay, let's let's go to item four: fire damage residential structures. Now, I'm settling thought I'm having about the 2050 plan is that I'm going to be 102 or 20. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and I'll be coming back to check. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be back in the spirit. At the last city council meeting, uh, I think uh, Councilman Walker, Chief Walker, had handed a, um, a, burned, a fire damaged house and asked to put it on the agenda. So as I went to look at that, went back to some of your prior meetings, you've had some other discussions about fire damaged properties. And I think at one point there was a question about how many of these, how many fire damaged properties do we have in the city that's in, in the code enforcement process? So I wanted to... Uh, Show you that, trying to answer that question, show you where those the addresses of those fire damaged properties, and then talk a little bit about the process. The process we have in place is a process that has worked for years and years, and it has, what it has done is brought these fire damaged properties to you for the adoption of an ordinance that orders the demolition of those properties. So just take a few minutes to look and see where, where these are, how many we have, and uh, a little bit about our process. And we'll call on Emily again. Thanks again. Um, so what I'm presenting to you today is a list of dilapidated structures that have been fire damaged or dilapidated because of fire damage um, and where those particular properties are in the enforcement process. But before I dive into the specific properties, just a very brief overview of dilapidation. As a reminder, uh, structures are considered dilapidated 
if our community code officials determine that the cost to repair a home that does not meet the minimum housing code, um, the cost to repair is uh, or can't be repaired for uh, less than 40% of the existing cost of the home. And if that's the case, then it's considered dilapidated. Um, the process, the enforcement process that our community code team um, walks through is first an issuance of a complaint um, when they identify a dwelling that appears to not be in compliance um, with the minimum housing code and it appears to be unfit for human habitation. Um, they send a notice to that property owner and then they hold a housing code hearing and they um, notify the property owner of the date of that hearing and invite that property owner to come into that hearing to discuss the condition of the home. Um, if after the notice and the hearing described, um, the community code administrator determines um, that the dwelling under consideration is dilapidated and it's unsafe for human habitation, according to the standards of our ordinance, um, then they will issue an order to that property owner that they have a certain amount of time to repair, vacate, and or demolish that structure. And they make that determination at the housing hearing. Typically, they're given between 30 and 90 days, depending upon the condition of the home, uh, to remedy that issue. Um, if there is a failure by the property owner to act within that period of time, then the city can move forward with demolition if it wishes. So if they don't comply with that, with the date of that order. Any questions about that for? Yeah. Oh, he's gone. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the process that you just outlined is that normal, customary, and documented within our ordinances that we've already adopted, or have any of those steps changed? Yes. The, the minimum housing code enforcement is well articulated in the minimum housing code. And so that's not changed in the last few years. The process has not changed. That's correct. Okay. So this process that we've always undergone, and I'm directing to you, is legal and meets whatever um, requirements the general statute outlines responsibility to the city of Rocky Mountain. It, it does. Prior to demolition. Correct. So there is no abrogation or violation of general statute policy as we walk through those steps that you just took. Thank you. You're going to answer that, Mr. Barty. Going to answer. Uh, I don't know why it took at least six times um, for me quoting our ordinance, <coughs> our policy on demolition. I could not get those houses torn down, and saying that we were not um, demolishing houses illegally. How did that come about? I'm just trying to figure out why did it take so long with the process that we had. And I quoted it that we've been following this process the last 30, 40 years um, and could not get those houses demolished. It was Zenith Court, um, Discovery, Pender Street, East Grand Avenue, and there's one more. I can't answer why it hasn't worked for years and years and years. This this same process, this this code has been in, in force for 40 years, 50 years, a long time, and and for years and years and years, the way it has worked is we 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 bring the the these addresses, these homes, the projects up to you after they've gone through the process. You're the last step. And the step that you, we call on you to do is to adopt an ordinance ordering the demolition of this house or that house. That's how it works. And now, uh, I can't explain why, why that, if, if there's been a blockage or a stoppage or something in that process. We have, you know, prior city managers, uh, we've always followed the process. And, and, and you've adopted, I don't know how many orders over the years, lots of, it's a hard thing to do. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a big deal. To order the demolition of a house, but but we do that, and and you're going to see in this list, I think it's, it's six or eight that already 
you know, they, I mean, they're ready to give to you to adopt these an ordinance on each one of those. I don't know if there's been a blockage in the last two years or, or four years or, or what. I don't. I can't explain that. But. And we asked if uh, the previous manager restore the funding back. Has that been? Do you know what's the? It was. I think there's a hundred thousand dollars in the budget for demolition. Um, you know, I think you're going to need a little more money to do that. <laughs> 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 we just need a fire department training drill. <laughs> uh, we have the empowerment <laughs> up until even this year, uh, $200,000. So I've been asking, where is the money? Did the money go to salaries or did it go somewhere else? But this council, as of 2003, uh, the demolition for housing to, to be demolished was about sixty thousand. We voted to increase it two hundred thousand. So up until the time you left, where is the money? What do we have? Do we have? We have but we asked to restore that back. Yeah, is it we back? we have been following to the best of our ability the balance that is available for demolition, based and it's similar to how we do some other things. From the standpoint of the annual appropriations plus any savings that have accrued from prior years. Uh, there is money available that can be appropriated to do that. I can, um, I will simply say that the prior manager with respect to where he wanted to prioritize appropriations set the, set the funding level at $100,000. You are correct that prior, in prior years it had been $200,000 and then there had been small appropriations also made for commercial demolition, which is separate from residential demolition. So what I'm, what we can do is provide you with the actual total of our calculation of the available of the available balance that can be appropriated to make available for additional demolition. Can the manager, once the council approves something, take money out without the authority of the council? And In my opinion, you shouldn't do that without coming back to you because okay. your, your will is to do this thing and you put money on it. My thought about it would be to carry out your will. Thank you. Well, now we want to set this coverage. Yeah, well, they're, they're working on it. Yeah. Okay. Can we keep on? Yes, let's keep on because we got we got more to go. Full schedule. I'm just going to provide photos and a quick overview of what the status for each of the properties. So you have um, uh, a the table in the packet that lists the address, the county, ward, and specific neighborhood of each of these homes. Um, the first is 130 North Discovery Street. This property is currently in the foreclosure pro process with Edgecombe County. Um, so in terms of demolition, uh, we're, we're holding as that particular process works its way through. The next is 109 Owen Circle. Um, this is in the Battleboro neighborhood. and in terms of our process, this property would be ready for a demolition ordinance. Um, just as food for thought and information, we have been contacted by a nearby property owner who has interest in purchasing this property um, and would like to do so prior to demolition. So I'm just um, giving that information to you for food for thought. Um, the next is one, oh, sorry, 1110 Hargrove Street in the Southeast Rocky Mountain neighborhood. This and several of the homes following are ready for demolition, pending review of the case file by the city attorney. Um, before we bring anything to you, I would rather just make sure that everything is in line in terms of public notice and every other documentation that we would need uh, before bringing that to you. So we intend to put the case files together and send it to our uh, legal counsel for review. Is that for and scrolled? Yes, sir. Okay. 1206 Branch Street which is in, again, the Southeast Rocky Mountain neighborhood. Also ready pending review of the case file. 705 Powell Drive in the South Rocky Mountain neighborhood, pending approval, or sorry, pending ordinance um, after review by the city attorney. 117 Lisa Court in the Williford neighborhood, also ready for demolition pending review. 611 East Grand. This is in the Holly Street neighborhood. 
and 905 Redgate Avenue, which is also in the southeast Rocky Mount neighborhood. Ready for demolition, pending review by the city attorney. And then this property and the two that follow um, are not quite ready for a demolition ordinance for council review. Um, a title report has been requested on these three properties and a housing hearing will be scheduled as soon as we confirm ownership of the property. So this is uh, 2109 South Church Street, which is in the South Rocky Mountain neighborhood. This is 1820 Blandwood Drive, Southeast Rocky Mount. And then finally, 907 East Raleigh in the Holly Street neighborhood. So may, may I ask a question in the, in the work with the attorney? So um, it seems at least the last three properties, we're all trying to figure out ownership, right? So is there, does general statute give us some period of time when we've done best search or all that we can do if we cannot establish um, clarity in ownership or will this process establish clarity in ownership? So we know how to move forward. The, the, the title report, the reason we do that is to establish that clarity. And, right. and you know, we can rely on the title report once we get it. So it's not a question of do we need to go tracking through family trees. We, we, we can base our decision to demolish based on the title report. So whatever comes back, then we at least have a way forward, way to move forward. C correct. I mean, could, could there be could something a little wacky in the title report that takes some extra time, yes, but the title report will give us a way. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I see some of these could take time. I see a, a 705 Power Drive, date of initial inspection, April of 2020. Um, you know, that's over four years ago, and now it's ready for demolition. So is that is that standard you know, for something to take that long in the process? Well, we have a long list of dilapidated structures. Some of them have come forward for demolition, and some of them haven't. Some of them have been on our list for for multiple years. Um, but but this is a fire damaged home um, that we believe is is ready, um, given our documentation and um, ownership information. Gotcha. In the past, what we've tried to do is fire damaged. Fire damaged is a subset of the overall dilapidated housing list and, and they so what we're trying to do is uh, is move in the past anyway move fire damage structures more quickly through this process than than a non-fire damaged one and it's because the neighborhood uh, surrounding a fire damaged house is really concerned about uh, you know the, the look of it and, and uh, what it does to the neighborhood and property values and all of that so you, you get a lot of calls when you have a fire damage home you get a lot of calls Sure. We tried to move those to the past anyway. Move those more quickly. Councilman Harris? Yeah, uh, Ms. Pinkston, thank you so very much for giving us this information. I'm pleased that we only have 11. Just one. You know, to be honest with you, I suspected there could have been more. Uh, switching types of properties. Do you have any idea? Fire damage, commercial properties, business properties. What there might be out there. I know that's totally different, but we do have some fire damage, commercial properties, mm -hmm. and business properties. And the money to rectify that problem is huge. But do we have any idea what's out there? I don't. So right now we don't have. A list similar to what we do for residential properties. Should we start working on a list when time is permitted, et cetera? We can, we can do that. We have there, are, there are a good number of fire damage commercial structures out there, and they are expensive to, uh, to go from a, a process needing to demolition of those. But we can generate a, an inventory of those. Thank you for that, Ms. Pinkson. I think you've got probably the next one on the text amendment offenses. I do. Can I add one point of clarity um, to Council Member Harris's uh, question, which is that the properties presented to you today are the fire damage properties that are with the, that are in the code enforcement process. 
we have been working with the fire department and we do have a list of fire damaged properties that are not yet within our enforcement process. So we're working with them to, um, to get that list and to begin housing code inspection. So um, there, there are more and we'll be getting to those and entering those in our housing code process in the near future. All right. Um, there has been a text amendment has come forward to the city council, I think, from the planning board and there was some conversation about uh, just what that is and a little bit about the process. I think I've tried to fix the process by asking our staff to, uh, for future text amendments, rather than go to the planning board and then to the city council, is to come to the city council first and then uh, and then go back to the planning board and go through that. So you don't get caught unawares or caught by surprise about what, what that is. And I also wanted on the fence, amend, fence text amendment one to just explain what, what the changes are so we can see uh, what's contemplated. Thank you. And so this is a review of the fence and wall text amendments that you all reviewed at council a number of weeks ago. So this is an opportunity to talk more in depth about those uh, proposed changes and what those mean and the intent behind those regulations and then open it up to you uh, for more feedback. So the requested action is to amend the land development code uh, to clarify and update our fence and wall standards, which is section 710 of the land development code in summary, uh, to clarify what the front yard is with respect to fence height, um, prohibiting fences on properties without an approved primary use. Um, it, it establishes standards for appropriate fence materials and for fence and wall maintenance. And I'm going to dive into the, the details of those proposed amendments now. Um, the first is um, the text amendment to clarify the front yard. So what you're seeing here is the actual uh, change in the ordinance language. Um, the strike through is the text to be removed in red. And then the text to be added is um, underlined and highlighted in yellow. So in this case, um, the land development code states that fences within front yards cannot be taller than four feet. And fences inside and rear yards can be uh, six and a half feet tall. And this proposed text amendment is intended to clarify what the front yard is. Currently it reads, in the front yard setback area, fences and walls cannot exceed four feet in height. And there's a little bit of confusion there because it could mean the setback area. So there's a setback for buildings, which could be 10 feet. We'll say, for example, that the building setback is 10 feet from the street, but the house could be set back 30 feet. So which in which area can it be only four feet? And we've always interpreted it as the actual front yard between the street and the house. So we wanted to add clarity to the language around that. So in order to make that clarification, um, we've scratched in the front yard setback and added um, no fence or wall shall exceed four feet in height in the front yard in parentheses the area between the front property line which in this uh, visual is right here and the front elevation of the main building so in this area in blue the fence height could not exceed four feet in height but beyond that area it could be up to six and a half feet and it makes that distinction, the proposed text amendment makes that distinct, distinction for both residential and then uh, commercial properties. Do you, do you, want, to, you want me to not ask questions now? How do you want to go? I I'll mean, write, I'm okay. I'm I'll okay. Run through it that's and fine. Then that's fine. That works for you. Yeah, sure. That's fine. Perfect. Um, the second section is prohibiting fences on properties without primary uses. So this is an addition, no change, just an addition to the text. Um, fences and walls are prohibited for any undeveloped lot that has no primary or permitted use. Uh, for example, outdoor storage is a use that can be permitted on an otherwise undeveloped lot. Uh, so prohibiting fences if there's not permitted primary use. And then there's an exception here proposed that fences and walls may be erected for permitted community gardens in accordance with the residential fence regulations. So creating an exception for that. 
Um, the next establishes standards for appropriate fence materials, and all of this text is proposed new. It's not modifying any existing text. Um, the intent of these regulations are to prohibit um, unsightly fence materials that our zoning officers and staff have seen uh, while they're out uh, canvassing neighborhoods. And this is an example of something that we have seen, which is a plywood fence. So the intent is to prohibit that unsightly material. So the proposed language is that all new fences and walls shall meet the height and materials requirements. Um, acceptable materials are masonry and stone, ornamental iron, steel, or aluminum, wood, composite materials designed to appear as wood, metal, or masonry, or chain link, except where chain link would otherwise be prohibited by the ordinance. Um, prohibited materials include debris or waste products, used tires, shipping pallets. We have seen a fence made out of shipping pallets before. Um, rolled plastic or sheet metal, untreated or unpainted plywood, uh, and so on. And then we do have an area for discretion here. The Director of Development Services may approve alternative fencing materials if the proposed design is compatible with the surrounding environment. So if it doesn't um, fall within the listed categories for acceptable materials, but we otherwise feel that it's compatible, there's a little bit of discretion built in there. So again, the intent is to prohibit some of the fencing materials that we've seen while uh, we're out in the neighborhoods. And then similarly, um, establishing standards for maintenance of fencing. This is all new text as well. Fences, walls, and hedges shall be installed and maintained so as not to interfere with sight distance and parking areas, driveways, and street corners. So uh, we want to make sure that cars backing in or sorry, backing out and pulling into driveways have clear visibility of oncoming traffic. So that's intended to be uh, a safety measure. And then fences and walls not maintained in a safe manner due to neglect, lack of repair, poor construction, or that can otherwise be considered a public safety hazard by a building official shall be removed or repaired. So this addresses fences that are in poor condition and could pose a safety hazard. During the discussion a few weeks ago at council, there was a question about grandfathering and how that would be applied in this case. If um, the proposed fence ordinance is approved, any existing fence that had previously received a fence permit uh, that, that doesn't comply with the new standard to be allowed to remain. So let's say, for example, there was a fence um, that received a permit that was made out of plywood um, because there was no regulation prior they would be allowed to continue using that fence. They wouldn't have to bring it down because they received a permit. Um, but an existing fence that was not issued a permit would be subject to the new standards. Um, so with that, I'll open that to you um, to hear your concerns or any thoughts about ways that uh, we might address concerns related to grandfathering or otherwise. Councilman Blackwell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. And I know I started asking the primary questions myself, so thanks for uh, bringing this for us to discuss. So can you go back and help me understand, help me understand, I'm, I want to read the first number one. In the front yard, the area between the front property line and front elevation of the main building. So if you have a house that's set back further than, you know, the 19 or whatever feet 10 feet or whatever it is, it sets back farther. Are you talking about if the fence begins at the side of the house or behind the house, that can be no higher than four feet? Is that what you're saying? If the fence is between the front property line and then the front elevation of the house, it would have to be four, four feet. feet or less. But beyond that... Beyond, behind the front elevation of the house would be six feet. In the backyard, they could have what would be considered a privacy fence, a right. taller fence. Right. And that's, that, that was my first concern because there are older neighborhoods in our city, which I represent and I live in one, where um, there have been vandalism <clears throat> issues, theft issues. We have alleyways, you know, behind our homes, and people have 
and run and jump over whatever the bushes have been uh, from the backyard to the front yard or from the front yard to the back. And what my concern about the four feet is where where does four feet really begin? Because you can jump four feet. You're young and spry and motivated because you're running from something or to something, you know, or if you have malintent and are trying to see what's in a person's yard behind to see if it's something you want to, you know, four feet is not adequate to um, keep that from happening. And so um, in the um, evaluation of whatever, if, if it gets adopted, if we adopt this, how would you look at that situation in those communities? Is it just, this is the policy, this is what it is? How do you deal with that? That's, that's the part I, I, I struggle with from our conversation, even around that we started out with around um, uh, planning and zoning. Is one of equity. Every neighborhood doesn't have the same social dynamics as the other. In some neighborhoods, why it sounds like it makes perfect sense. In some neighborhoods, it does make it makes might not might as well not have a fence if it's four feet tall. You know, just open it up and let people come and go as they want to. Can I get clarification, Council Blackwell, to yeah. make sure I understand? Yeah. Are you are you saying? You're suggesting a six and a half fence all the way around front, back, side, everything, or Miss Pinkson, if you could, where that line from the front, you you could enclose right there from from the side, from the side of the yard to the house with a six and a half foot fence. That's that's the question I was asking. I was asking. Okay, that's what. I, that's the question I was asking. Does it start if my house is <coughs> here? You know, this is the front of the house. Four feet is in front of the house, or four feet is beside the house, or four feet is here. Well, if, if you could put your finger right there, you could do a six and a half foot that attaches to the side of the house. Right. You would start your six and a half foot fence here because it's parallel to the front plane of the house. You have a six and a half foot fence all the way around to here. So you could bring it over to that front wall and enclose the backyard. And then, but if you wanted to enclose the whole yard, it would have to come down in height in the front yard. So I think that helps me a little bit. Now, where, now you also have provision for up to eight feet, but it had some requirement. That's approved by the planning board. For something. It was like a maximum height of 10 feet. When, when, when does that apply? Business. Business only. Yeah, business only. So I can already tell you in my neighborhood, we have a number, unless I'm wrong, may I, which I'm frequently wrong, so I might not be right. <laughs> but I'm just saying, it's, it's, I see fences higher than six well, and a half. Yeah, of course, that's right there. Fences and walls along the side and rear lot lines may be constructed to a maximum height of eight feet if approved by the planning board. As part of a residential plan building group. So that's and that's the part. Two two things. What does that mean? What does that mean? And mm -hmm. if people buy their fences from Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever, and they go to a company like that to purchase a kit, nobody tells them at Lowe's that you gotta purchase a, a permit. If you go to sign companies and you say, I want to put up a sign, the sign company tells you in order to erect this sign at this location, you have to meet these qualifications. But most people don't, you know, buy kits and put their fences up themselves. Some people do, but most people don't. And, and so is there any, has there been any conversation or discussion with Central Building Supply, Lowe's, if that's part of their policy, part of their pricing structure, that they've included the cost of fence permits with that. Because I still don't think that most people in Rocky Mount understand no. that you have to get a permit to put a fence up unless you're in a specialized industry. If you're a builder, you might know that, you know, or if you've had a challenge or 
probably, you might know that, but I just think most people don't know that. So how do where where is our responsibility on that point of information? What's our responsibility to make sure that people know that? And what can we do to make it more um, to take away the excuse I didn't know about it? I think our role in that is education and to get that information out as, as best we can to let people know that fence permits are required. And it really is in their best benefit to do yeah. that too, so we can ensure that the fences are on the property line, that they don't extend into the neighbor's property by accident, um, that they do comply and don't have issues <coughs> on the road. So you know, it, it's, on, uh, it's our responsibility to, to get the word out as best we can and communicate that. So that's something that we can, we can look at and figure out how can we um, educate and uh, share this information as well. I also agree to educate because I got a question this morning um, about the new house in the back of Meadowbrook. We got some that was built in those open areas. So ladies like, you know, I got a new house I'm moving in next, next month. How can I, what do I do about my fence? And so I think that is, that is key for us to educate people on defense and laws uh, because like you said in some of those i forgot the name of that neighborhood Meadowbrook, you got a few houses stuck in the hole uh by thorn ridge yeah. so mm -hmm. she's like my neighbor already mm -hmm. have this fence yeah. and so yeah. what do i do here and that's kind of strange uh she asked that this morning so I was like, yeah. yeah so she wouldn't be grandfathered in with a new house but the neighbors are yeah struck so I think maybe especially finding out when new developments happen and we can educate them about fencing. So that is key. Yeah. Two questions. One, is there any situation where a permit is not needed? For a fence? Not that I can think of. Fences are required. Yeah. Permits are required. Yeah. 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 Well, it seems like to me communication, electrical hookups, gas hookups, mm -hmm. water hookups. They contact the city. It might be good to say, oh, by the way, Mr. Homeowner or whatever, that we do have a policy regarding fences. Are you contemplating a new fence or repairing an existing fence or whatever? It seems like to me the more proactive we can be, maybe can. But, you know, I hate to say it, but I see fences being erected all the time. Yeah. And to me, I doubt if people have gone and gotten a permit. Maybe it'll do a homeowner package or something yeah. like that. Realtor association. Yeah. Or right. There you go. Well, welcome, this is yeah. new homeowner, yeah. and if you think you need to know about what you can do or can't do. And so, yeah. with Councilman Harris, to your thing about a permit, um, many years ago, installed a fence in a, in a commercial building I have. And little did I know that soon after the Nash County tax um, assessor came through to measure that fence so he could tax the improvement on my property. So it's also a taxing tax right. piece. Councilman Blackwell, sorry about that. I had no. to put that in there. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a great example. So, to the consequence. So, I think what we're talking about. That's right. So, so if we adopt this ordinance or something similar to it, and um, what pushes the button on noncompliance, and then what happens if a homeowner cannot afford, if they know that they're out of compliance with the fence, that they did not receive a permit to build the fence or can't document that they might have purchased the home, moved in the home, the fence was already there when they purchased the home and they had no idea that it was a non-permitted um, structure on the property. And then our department goes to them and says, okay, you're out of compliance. What does the city do then? Do we find the individual? Do we tear the fence down? What, what is the uh, recrimination to the homeowner for being out of compliance? So I want to clarify just one thing that the proposed text amendment is just mainly dealing with maintenance and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and materials. Okay. So today, um, there's there are likely fences that have been constructed without permits. So we're dealing with, with this issue today with uh, fences that, that didn't have permits that might be 
too too tall or might be on someone else's property yeah. um, unintentionally and so on and so um, you know our approach is generally to work with people and explain what the regulations are um, and uh, encourage them to get a permit if they hadn't sometimes the fence does comply they just don't have the paperwork and so you know we'll, we'll help them uh, we'll facilitate them getting that permit so we have record of it um, if it's not in compliance then you know we would try to figure out what the best solution for them would be. Um, if it's on someone else's property, do they just remove a portion of the fence, or what's the best solution for them so they can, uh, you know, get the end result that, that they're looking for? So we certainly try to problem solve with our customers. Councilman, Council uh, do we have a lot of citizens complaining about the ordinance for the fence? For the Fence height or yeah. material? Just anything. Um, I know we've received a few complaints about materials, um, the, the plywood and the um, uh, pallet fences, but otherwise, I'm not aware of many other complaints. I was wondering how it you know, became an issue. But just to give a story, um, I purchased the old Henry Gregory house on. Brassel Street, and it was a, not was that, but still is, a brick fence. I think it was 10 feet. It was a little bit over 8 feet. But the neighbor probably hated me because she was running against Reuben with city council and complained about the brick wall. We had started leaning a little bit, and so it was probably not even a foot between my property line and her garage. The city inspector came out and told me that I had to take the brick fence down. I said, you are lying. I'm not taking it down because I didn't put it up. Number two, um, I said, how can this be a safety issue? Because you can't even, a person can't even walk behind brick wall. They said, well, the brick wall could fall on a cat or a dog. And so it took me a, some time. So what I decided to do is take a portion of the level of the, uh, of the fence, um, the bricks that was falling, just remove that. But I think that uh, at some point, um, if you got a neighbor that got an issue with you, that didn't have it with you before, you're going to be getting a lot of calls. On it. I'm not saying we shouldn't pass it, but sometimes we run into those kind of things. And I just felt that it was, I was being treated totally unfair. Uh, number one, the staff came out and said I had to remove the wall. And number two, I started asking questions until I was able to get uh, just remove maybe two layers of brick. And the wall is still standing, and the people moved back to California. <laughs> A few more questions on the fence piece so we can get to the dirt street paving and resurfacing. Ms. Benson, thank you. I know you've been up here a while. I wanted to just show you the list of uh, dirt streets that are planned to be paved in this fiscal year and also show you the list of, uh, of streets that are on the resurfacing list. We'll look at this, uh, this slide up here. These are the streets that are planned to be uh, paved. These are dirt streets that are planned to be paved in this fiscal year. Wheeler Drive, Oak Drive, Mercedes, Melbourne, and uh, East, Total uh, Park. All of those are going to be somewhere, we think, around $850,000. That's budgeted in the budget to do those. Uh, these are other streets uh, that are dirt streets that are, are planned to be uh, paved in, in future years as we get money available. We've been doing paving dirt streets a little bit at a time, and the priority has been uh, determined based on whether there's water or sewer and or sewer in the street. 
whether people live on the street, and whether there's any traffic on the street, those kinds of considerations. So they're trying to uh, pave those streets that, uh, you know, where there are people and where there's traffic, and especially where there's water and sewer. When you when we have a street that does not have water and sewer, then now you're talking about a lot more money to get the get the infrastructure in the street before you resurface it. So it's taking time to do it, but, but you can see the rest of the street. It's going to take a little while to keep on going. Can you put up any questions about those? So in the budget this year, you got 873. That was just, did I get that right? 873. 344, is that what you're saying? Would, would be paving? Okay, so those those are priorities for this, 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 year, this, this year. This year, yeah. so uh, seven twenty whatever. Yeah, seven twenty one. Yeah, yeah. Seven twenty one. Now we plan to um, go out to bid sometime in December with construction in the spring. Thanks. Thank you. And can we call up the uh, resurfacing? I think the TJ had. Councilman TJ Walker. Mr. Right. Those, those streets that don't have, uh, and I'm assuming this is why they weren't paid, but there are a lot of streets that are uh, continuum streets that they have, still have the same street name, Francis South Great Street. Uh, it's a continuum of a street, but if the if the process or reason behind why the whole street wasn't paid was because of infrastructure, can we just look at that and figure out how we can communicate that to constituents? Because it's, you know, Puts us in a tough spot to say half of the street was resurfaced, and you then there's you don't qualify for paving. I, I don't, I don't, and, and it's hard for me to explain right. it when they have to live. I mean, they're like you said, they're still living there because yeah. their houses are still on the street. Um, but that's that's multiple streets within communities. I mean, Starling Way, for instance, you've got Starling Way repaid, but then all of your inner neighborhood side roads that still have residents are unpaid, and so it causes a, a major concern. I think in the past we have required uh, petitions. People mm -hmm. live on those. They have to petition for water and or sewer and those kinds of things. We don't have a petition and we don't do it. I think, we, uh, I think we've been a little more liberal about that in more recent years about trying to get those that, that infrastructure into those streets into the right of way, whether there's a petition or not, in order to encourage development. Um, are you okay? Yeah, these, this is a list of uh, streets that we have on the uh, resurfacing list. Let's see. Uh, you can go over this a little bit more to the right. Oops, here we go. At the top of the list, you'll see FDR. That's not Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That's <laughs> not full depth reclamation. That's an engineering term that means. Tear out everything that is the asphalt and also remove all the base, go back to Adam and Eve and put new base down and uh, new asphalt on Full reconstruction of the street. You can see those, and that's, an extra, that's where the money, that's where the expense is. Can you go up just a little bit? So I can go up a little bit. Then, then you'll see these, these are research for us. Streets that are to be resurfaced, oh. and uh, the plan for those on that list is um, is to take the money that we have in the power bill and in the license fee account for this year in 2025 and add it to the money that we believe is going to be coming from power bill and license fee money in 2026. Put those two sums together and then go out with this project. So this likely would be done in 20. 26. We think we can do all these in two years span. Yeah. yeah. We're going to accumulate the money first, right. then go do the work. You get better pricing when we have more mass, in right. mass, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the contract. So we're asking for patience from our constituents. But we have a number of streets that we think we'll be able to bid together. But we just got to wait. So we're 
like the same time. So yeah. it's fine. Any idea what the total miles are of unpaved road? Total miles. How many miles? I think Ish. about five miles or six okay. miles, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's about no, so you say we're going to. About four or three miles. Okay. Three miles. Unpaved. Well, um, yeah, I'm looking at his numbers at 16, 6, 14, so that'd be about three miles. Okay. And this is a two year plan to resurface them, or oh. we've begun to work on some of these already? You're looking at the research. The research, the preliminary, preliminary uh, page. Yeah, that that list. What we're saying is um, that's that's what's next on the on the deck to be done. And what we're doing is accumulating money. We're going to accumulate money from this fiscal year and carry that forward into the next fiscal year and add this year's money to next year's money and then do that list. But but it's it's uh, in 2026, not 2025. Got it. Some of some of this already been some of this has already been uh, it may be the sheet may be happening, but some of this has already happened, and it may just be a, a typo of the where the beginning location and ending location. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, any, any more any more questions for Mr. Horning? Because we successfully taken what we thought would be less than three hours, we spent three hours on it, and uh, we're not able to go into closed session before. City Council meeting. Are you also asking for priority in council as well for this list? No, I'm not asking for priority. I'm just asking. I'm just saying that this is what we're looking at. Okay. And so, so you would know that. But, but if you have thoughts about what we should do, I shouldn't, shouldn't do with that list. You know, I don't want to hear that. But uh, I'm just saying, just so you know, this is what what we're looking at. So, um. This ends our taking portion of the view of the whole. Mr. Warren, what's your suggestion for the closed session that we plan? Okay. I don't know how long we got. I have a long list of uh, property issues to talk about in the uh, closed session. session, so that's going to be more than 10 minutes. Uh, I think mean, maybe another hour, perhaps. And I'm wondering if. Uh, if Y'all keep the debate to a minimum. <laughs> <laughs> if we could reconvene the committee as a whole. Patience and stamina to do that after the regular meeting, then we can work through that. Is. I'm fine. Are we okay? Okay. Okay. Do we do it? Yeah, a little break. Got some coffee. <laughs> All right. Uh, we will reconvene this uh, committee to also after the city council. We'll do it back in this room. We're going to lock this room. Can I just and, leave my stuff? Yeah, and, and I, I would suggest to the city council, I know a lot of people want to talk to us afterwards. So. Ding, ding, ding. Come, come around. Right. Let's, let's, don't, let's don't linger. Somebody wants to talk to you. I know, I know. 7 o'clock. <laughs> We're reading it on Facebook for you. Monday Night Lights. Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. That's right. All right, so do what you got to do. Get in there. Let's get out. <laughs> I didn't say anything.